June meeting of the CB4, CB1 Transportation and Street Permit Committee. Uh, this is, I want to welcome Jess Coleman, the co-chair, as well as Lucian Reynolds, our district manager. And also, hello, Cody, because I understand you're our new member. Thank you. I am glad to be here. Good. Well, we look forward to you joining us, and hopefully at the end we can get a little bit more talk, but we have some people who are pressed for time, so I, I want to keep moving with sure. today's agenda. And so, Jen Lung, I'm really glad you're able to make it, and if you'll be able to share your screen, Jess, for slides. Sorry. Thank you. And as you can see, we have a fairly full agenda tonight, but I think we can get through it if we stay on task. And the first item is with Jen Lung from the DOT. So I'm going to welcome her to if she'd like to speak a bit about the Lower Manhattan Pedestrian Priority Streets. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Jen Lee Young, uh, DOT Manhattan Commissioner's Office. Uh, I just have a short uh, update. Um, the Lower Manhattan Pedestrian Priority Street study was, was on hold during the earlier part of the pandemic. We have recently resumed the study. Uh, we are currently working on um, updating some of the existing conditions as well as the planning efforts that we've been working on. Um, I know the other thing that we end up we'll, we will end up doing later this year is to actually have a uh, stakeholder engagement session, and uh, that's all I have for now. Do you have any idea when that will be the stakeholder? I think we're trying to plan it for either uh, late in the summer or early fall. Great. Then I open it to if anyone has any questions. I assume Patrick that you do. Yeah, I, I, I mean, thanks Jennifer for the update. Um, I, I, I guess, is there anything more specific about, um, what's transpired between the meeting with former commissioner Trottenberg in February, 2020 and now? I actually don't have that information right now, but okay. I can, uh, double check and if I can, I will get back to you. Okay. Is there a sense, um, at this point where where things might be headed i know and I, I i and i ask this it's a little bit of a loaded question in a way because i know that uh the uh that commissioner rodriguez met with the borough president or council member who i see um, has a representative on this call tonight as well as well as separately with the downtown alliance um, all of whom have views uh, and I'm just sort of wondering, is there a sense from a policy perspective within DOT, um, how, how they're viewing, uh, you know, the make way for lower Manhattan initiative, which, as you know, this community board has supported for, I just checked and it's now almost 7 years since July of 2015, when we first adopted a resolution in support of make way for lower Manhattan. Um, is there a, a, a policy sense of, of where things might be headed? Um, I don't have that information. I would have to get back to you. Okay. I, I guess Betty, you can come back to me, but I, I would propose a, a resolution perhaps to maybe spur that, um, it, at least to make sure that the new commissioner and the new uh, administration at DOT is, is fully aware of this community board's support to make way for lower Manhattan over the years, but I would yield. No, I would support that. My thinking was to actually do it next month so that we have a month to kind of really think it out and put something together. And so we can work on that. Sounds good. If you're in agreement. Yeah. Yes, because I see that. So that Catherine McVeigh Hughes is also on. Yeah. But I don't see a hand up, so. I'm not sure if she, Catherine, do you also want to speak? Yes, her hand is up. If you could. Unmute Catherine so yep. that she can speak. Go ahead.
Captain, uh, are you having trouble with your audio? We could give you some time to switch your audio. Maybe in the meantime, Catherine, Lydia, no, uh, another she sent a chat. She's uh, question is the status of the Nassau Street pilot project. That's DDC. So I don't know that Jen would even be aware of that. J Jen, do you have any information about any Nassau Street pilot project? What was that? About the Nassau Street uh, pilot project, but in fact, the construction being done there is it's a DDC project. And so while it's important to coordinate the things, I'm not sure that you would have looked that up since it's not a DOT effort at this time, it's DDC. For Nassau Street between where and where? It's around Pi. It's Pine and Catherine, do you want to add any any additional information for that question? In the chat. Just a reminder that I'm the only one who can see the chat. It's it's not for discussion, but if someone's having trouble with their their microphone, they can send me messages. Well, Patrick, if you want to just unmic and and contribute what you want to say. Yeah, um, I mean, just from the Nassau Street um, pilot perspective, I think what Catherine may be referring to um, is the community board's prior support of um, a pilot. Uh, around the time of the pandemic on um, Nassau Street. Um, it, it, I, I'm just drawing a blank actually on some of the specifics, but um, I think that's what she was talking about, separate and apart from the other project that you were talking about. Uh, but I did have an, another question for Jen. Um, Please ask it, because the Nassau Street one, uh, I know at the time I was told by the commissioner that there wasn't a lot of support from the vendors on the street. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was about open yeah. restaurants and things. It was. <clears throat> yeah. Up. Okay. Um, yeah, I know, I, uh, you know, our friends at the downtown Alliance, I've heard similar things about businesses and being sort of ho-hum about, uh, you know, increasing pedestrian zones. Um, I don't know that that's completely true. And I think we would independently need to, to sort of drill down on that and survey them. But anyway, my question uh, for Jen, uh, Jennifer is, you mentioned the stakeholder meeting, hopefully this fall. Um, and I'm wondering who will be the stakeholders that will be invited. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the focus on the city agencies because of, you know, the, the, the real problem that we're trying to address um, is, is interagency, multi-agency, however you want to put it. And so I want to make sure that, you know, NYPD, sanitation, all the right players are in the room. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on who is expected to be there? Um, for this one, I'm not sure, but I think we did have a similar engagement earlier pre-pandemic. Right. Um, I don't think that one included agencies yet. I think that one was more of a stakeholder, like local stakeholders. I think we did have one with with Polly right before. Um, yes. I remember it was in February of 2020. I attended by phone, but there I think there were agencies there, including PD. Was there one at that time? Yeah. I was sitting next to someone from sanitation, between right. someone from sanitation and someone from the NYPD. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I was at that one for some reason then, because I'm drawing a blank. But let me, I, I can follow up and find out about that. Okay, yeah, I, I remember that one was was fairly productive um, and it'd be great okay. to, to pick up there and not have to totally reinvent it and start getting the agencies back involved. So thank you for that. Yep. Great, then any other questions before we let Jen go? Then I thank you, Jen, and I guess you're off to CB3. Thank I you, Jen. A few minutes, but uh, yeah, I will hop on by by be a little before six six thirty. Yeah, and no, I want to advise people on from CB one that CB three has now moved their transportation committee to conflict with ours, so that will affect the DOT time that's spent at our meeting as well as CB 3s But anyway, then what we will do is work on this this month, and so if anyone has any suggestions, by all means. 
email them to me and I'll be working with Patrick and Catherine Hughes and anyone else who's interested in put, working on the resolution to draw attention to working on this project. And, and thank you, Jen, because it is great that news that is moving forward at least. And with that, I will move to the second item on the agenda, electric passenger ferries. And I'm looking to see, oh, I did see Eric Breen's name. If you, he could be moved out of participants, out of attendees. Eric, you could unmute yourself. Mute. Hello, everybody. Hello. Okay, and I guess everybody can hear me now. Yes, you're loud and clear. And if you'd like to share screen, then just speak with uh, Jess and he can hand those controls to you. Okay, Eric, I had you want me to do your slides for you? Yeah, that would be great. That would just save me the complexity of trying to figure yeah. out how to do it myself. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, first, I got to say thanks uh, for the, the warm welcome to present. Um, it's a major undertaking that we're doing. We're, we're real, uh, real proud of it Been working hard um, with it with the, with the city of Elizabeth, uh, where, the, where the, the whole thing developed and then um, uh, linking it into the uh, Manhattan community is definitely a major part of it that we, that we take very seriously and uh, we want to um, you know, do our best to have everything go smooth. It's the first time I'm ever presenting to a community board, so I don't know. <laughs> I have no experience in doing so. Um, but um, yeah, we're uh, starting up a uh, a emissions free ferry service um, with the goal of um, going com completely emissions free once we have the electrical charging and infrastructure in place. Um, and I'll, we have a DOT grant application in for that. And I can I can explain that. Uh, so I guess maybe move to the move to the the next slide. Okay, um, the city of Elizabeth. Um, one of the things you're probably curious as to what's on the other side of the run. Um, the the city of Elizabeth uh, contributed these slides. Um, we're working with their uh, um, destination uh, Elizabeth destination marketing organization. Their their tourism arm. Um, Elizabeth has um, Newark Airport within its confines, has uh, the mills at Jersey Gardens Mall. It's a tremendously popular shopping mall. Um, the mall, to give you an idea, had um, 19 point million visitors in 2019, the last time it was counted. The Statue of Liberty during that time period had 4.9, so it's almost five times the, uh, the um, tourists going to the mall. It's kind of like the duty free shop for, for uh, Newark Airport. Uh, but I don't know, maybe the next slide. Let's move it along here. Um, so yeah, there it's uh really closer than you think. It 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 it's um there's a lot of a lot of restaurants there, um a lot of activity. Um is a, a tremendous I just did the uh, the tour of the Elizabeth bicycle um um you know bicycle event. Uh, it's 15 miles of bike trails along the waterfront along the Elizabeth River. Uh, that would develop in two stages by the uh, the mayor of Elizabeth, um, Chris Bolwage. Uh, just an amazing experience with you know winding along the Elizabeth River, and the, the trails actually go through parts of the city uh, along the developed portions of the river where it turns into kind of a concrete canal. Um, just amazing. So one of the things we're doing is putting bike racks on the boat because uh, we think the bike the biking is going to be so popular. Um, I guess uh, we can skip another slide there. Get into the okay. So this is about Elizabeth. There's um, it's Union County, New Jersey is is the third largest growing tourism uh, county in the state of New Jersey. Uh, it's quite a lot of history there. It's where uh, you know um, uh, Raymond Burr, the guy who was, was in that famous duel um, in American history. It's where he lived. Uh, there's um, uh, a tremendous amount of um, historic buildings. I didn't really actually know much about Elizabeth when we got started, and it's um, it, it's it's actually a very very unique city. It 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 seems to get overlooked. Um, it's just a sign on the Jersey Turnpike, and I'm I'm 58 years old. I can just remember driving up and down the Jersey Turnpike, seeing Elizabeth signs, and just thinking it was all it was all uh, refineries and stuff. But it's really not the case. It's a 
It's a beautiful city with amazing uh, residential neighborhoods, uh, thriving Portuguese community, bunch of bunch of really great restaurants. It's a really really cool place. Um, has the the, uh, the you know it's the side of it is basically the largest one of the largest seaports on the east coast too. So it's a tremendous amount of commerce, and then there's also um, uh, a lot of international um, travelers, a lot of tour groups that come in there. And um, Elizabeth views, and, and this is kind of key, it's one of the points I really wanted to convey during our presentation. Elizabeth conveys, Elizabeth wants to convey uh, these, these tour groups and passengers to the South Street Seaport um, to show, showcase the attractions that Lower Manhattan has to offer. Um, where, where the, uh, the, oh, by the way, the title of the, of the PowerPoint, so it was Pier 16, it's actually Pier 15, um, where, where we have a, um, we're negotiating with uh, Hornblower and um, going through the approval process with New York City EDC to, to pull the boat into uh, Pier 15. Uh, one of the reasons we want to use Pier 15 is it's completely covered uh, for uh, um, uh, non-seasonal, you know, for year-round operation. It's uh, it helps the resiliency of the operation by keeping snow and and uh, stuff off the uh, and rain off the passengers. Um, so, and then we have a, a, a long standing relationship. We're a completely independent small ferry company and we're, but we have a long relationship with Hornblower, which I'll go into. Uh, Hornblower leases the pier, Pier 15 from uh, New York City. Um, so anyway, get, getting back to Elizabeth, there's, a, there's um, Waranenko Park has lakes and, and rivers in it, uh, wooded, uh, a lot of colonial era history. Uh, tremendous restaurants, lots of Portuguese restaurants, uh, Portuguese uh, barbecue places. It's just just a just a really kind of a seems like a like it says in the bottom history's best kept secret. Um, okay, so I guess maybe the next slide. Um, yeah, music, arts, and culture. There's a big theater there. Uh, you know, big library. But you know the um, the tour de Elizabeth. I just mentioned that. That's amazing. There's a waterfront festival, Portugal Day Parade. They just had that this weekend. That that's amazing. Uh, there's there's car shows, all sorts of street festivals, uh, historic reenactments. Um, there's golf courses in the area. Uh, it's it's um, you know, and then then of course you have Newark Airport and the, the 13 hotels, uh, 13 large hotels that surround the airport there. So one of the things that we'll be doing is, is allowing, um, it might even, um, it would, for, for lower Manhattan residents, it would, it's a no brainer. It would make it so much faster and more convenient, easier and scenic to get to um, uh, Newark airport as opposed to sh schlepping it all the way to LaGuard LaGuardia. Um, and I guess you can take the next slide. Okay, uh, I mentioned this already, but Union County, where Elizabeth resides, is uh, uh, the third fastest growing tourism market in the state of New Jersey. Um, all right, next one, maybe. Okay, so all sorts of accolades uh, on the tourism. Uh, it's new. Uh, there's an amazing woman there, Jennifer Costa, who heads up. Um, she's literally amazing. She runs uh, the... Uh, Elizabeth Destination Marketing Organization. She's also uh, chairman of the Elizabeth Chamber of Commerce. Um, she has a master's degree, master's degree in diplomacy. Worked for the uh, um, uh, Portugal government and stuff like that. Really interesting background. Very, very uh, focused on um, developing the tourism for the city of Elizabeth. She's at the IPW conference in Orlando right now. That's why she couldn't co-present with me. Um, Big, big travel industry show in Orlando that's this week. Uh, the uh, Mills at Jersey Gardens Mall, um, again, that's just wildly popular. That was voted one of the best in the country for, for shopping. Okay, uh, maybe next slide. Um, this I put together myself. These are pictures I took, took myself on my bike ride. I did the, the Tour de Elizabeth. Um, and uh, the, the, the picture, on the lower left is the three columns. That's the entrance to one of the trail systems. It says the Elizabeth River Trail System. There were two trail systems, the, the two plaques next to that. One is the, the first uh, trail system and the, set, and the second one is the phase two. Um, the trails wind around the waterfront. You can see that 
the top center picture is um, where the trail runs parallel with the water for probably about three or four miles. And then it, uh, it branches off and it follows the Elizabeth River into town. Uh, it is absolutely an amazing trail system. It's 15 miles long. So it's, it's a real highlight, um, you know, super popular with 800 riders, um, 800 riders at the event. And, uh, it, you know, it's just, just a really, really good day. Uh, so that that's uh, extremely popular. We think you know there's there's probably a lot of pent up lower Manhattaners that want to go uh, go have a new backyard. You know. Um, okay, maybe next slide. Um, this is uh, early on in the process. We looked. You know, most ferry systems are subsidized. We're not. Um, and we looked early on in the process. We looked at uh, with Edmo, uh, the Elizabeth Develop Destination Marketing Organization. Um, they did a whole bunch of research to see whether or not a ferry would be supported by industry and the hotels and everything. And the results, you see all these big green bars, all these, um, the results were just phenomenal. They, they, everyone wanted it, hotels, the residents, um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, we got nines and tens the whole way. Uh, very, very interested in developing it. And then we, we looked at the, uh, the financials and we said, well, you know, it's got a major, uh, New York City, New York area airport, Newark airport, which has a hub carrier, United Airlines. And um, then we have the Mills Mall with the ridership there. And that's not even, that's not even without, you know, without counting commute, that's without counting commuters. So we have the, um, you know, the, the tourism, the mall, the airport, the commuters, and it, it just, it just makes, made sense. Um, and then it, it has, um, uh, you know, sustainability and equity, transportation equity aspects to it. We're, we're connecting um, the uh, the workforce in Elizabeth with the uh, financial district in Manhattan. So as far as transportation equity and helping people, it wound up being, you know, a phenomenal, a phenomenal thing to do. Uh, so it's um, it's good for that reason. One of the things I didn't mention in the, in the PowerPoint is um, um, we're very into maritime history. And uh, we have um, we have we're working with the Elizabeth Area Museum and coordinating uh, a history tour of the of the uh, Kill Van Cull. There's a geofencing system on our boats that automatically plays history videos. So we we advertise the uh, uh, history of the shipyards, the Kill Van Cull, um, some some nautical events that happened there. The uh, National Lighthouse Museum as we pass the ferry, the Staten Island Ferry Slip. That's just adjacent to that. And then we. Uh, as we round the turn, we start talking about the Statue of Liberty, and uh, then we connect with, um, with uh, you know, Pier 15. We've worked with uh, uh, Jonathan Bulware at, at the Seaport Museum, trying to coordinate the history there uh, to bring ridership into the museum, uh, as well as Howard Hughes Corporation bringing ridership into the Seaport, um, you know, all the, all the history related to Seaport and obviously the attractions to restaurants and stuff. Uh, so we see that as a as a major thing. And as as a sidebar, um, Jennifer Costa's family house was bought from uh, a uh, gentleman who wrote um, the book on sea shanties that were collected from the residents of the Snug Harbor Sailors' Home on Staten Island. And her her great grandfather was ticketed for the Titanic and uh, missed his train, and her her, her family ha still has his ticket. So I can, it was just like history is kind of ingrained in us. Um, I'm, I'm a Kings Point Marine engineer. I've worked in the maritime industry and I'm, I'm all about the maritime industry. Um, so we wanna, we wanna support the history. We see that there's a lot we can do. Maybe, maybe connect the, uh, you know, the lighthouse. We're gonna pass the lighthouse museum literally like 16 times a day and they have an 800 foot pier. So it'd be a wonderful thing to connect that history to the, to the South Street Seaport Museum. Um, but, you know, we have all these aspirations, but you know, it's it's we're we're uh, in the startup phase, and you know, there's no no ridership history and everything. We just have to get this off the ground first. But there's there's so much potential for what we could actually do. Um, okay, so I guess uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, so it, the the first kind is like kind of funny. Let's do it sustainable. It's the only way we roll. We we don't roll, but we float. <laughs> um. Where um, uh, we did uh, studies and we listened listening to uh, the tourism indicators, um, and everyone wants you know all the all the all the uh, 
commuters now, especially younger folks, want um, sustainable options when they travel. Uh, three in five consumers have opted for environmentally friendly transportation or lodging. Uh, so it clearly shows that uh, that sustainability is a big a big option. So we kind of knocked that out of the park with with both our experience and our goals. And I'm, I'm I'm just about to um, dive into that. So we basically want to set a new precedent. Uh, for clean ferry transport in New York Harbor, um, and my company has a, a, a been kind of blessed with a bunch of work. I had a, a 35 year career doing uh, marine electrical systems on ships, and the entire industry decided to shift into electric propulsion. So I just happened to be in the right career at the right time. Um, so uh, next slide, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, so Elizabeth Fast Ferry um, was was formed by myself and uh, uh, Fred Ardolino, who who owns uh, New York Cruises. Um, Fred was my first customer when I started my business 35 years ago. Um, he had a contract with the city of Elizabeth, or arrangement to use the pier in the city of Elizabeth, city of Elizabeth, uh, with his dinner boat. Um, he has a 500 passenger dinner boat. He keeps in Sheep's at Bay. I docked it routinely in in Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth came to him United, with with United Airlines, and they were interested in establishing a ferry. Uh, interesting thing is, it's a it's a, a waterfront city uh, with an easy commuting distance in New York with a major airport, and no one ever addressed putting a ferry there. Uh, so we're we're um, uh, my company is the leader in U.S. zero emissions electric ferry technology. We've done um, all the electric ferries on all three coasts of the United States. We did the first one down in uh, Alabama. Um, uh, the next two, the next three, we did for the uh, National Park Service Alcatraz Island Ferry System. All the tour ferries, tourist ferries, that go to Alcatraz. Uh, that picture is the I think it's either the Clipper or the Flyer. I can't remember which boat it is. Like it's too small to read. But that's one of the uh, Alcatraz Island ferries, and that's all. That's all solar panels and wind turbines on the top of it. That's uh, we converted those boats twice: once to hybrids in 2012, 13, and we just finished converting them to uh, full electric, complete zero emissions operation. Um, so we, uh, um, you know, after after a analyzing all the potential ridership. Uh, from Newark Airport, the traffic from the Mills Mall, the volume statistics that Elizabeth sp spent all this time developing, it became really clear that the you know the the, the location of, of Elizabeth on the Kilvan Cull and its close proximity to the city were ideal for the range of an electric boat. Um, it's well within the battery capacity, um, so this is this has uh, you know roots in engineering too. It's it's you know. Um, when you get down to South Amboy, you start stretching the available battery capacity to make something viable. Um, but Elizabeth is right smack in a sweet spot. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, want to apply, you know, what, what experience we have and develop the, the first all electric ferry service in uh, on the East Coast and in New York Harbor. We're way behind Europe, way behind. And it's, it's, it's nothing short of disgusting. Um, it's uh, you know like the Super Bowl commercial where I think it was Bill Murray or something they were making fun of Norway because it was so advanced in uh, electric vehicles. This is even worse. Um, there's there's no you know there's the um, Lisbon Portugal just just announced ten electric ferries for for Lisbon Harbor. Norway has seventy. We have none. Um, so it's uh, it's you know it's a, quite a big undertaking. Uh, I, I guess go to the next slide. Okay, these are the uh, all of the electric uh, uh, ferries and ships that we've we've done. Um, uh, the New York Hornblower New York Hybrid that was that was in New York Harbor that was actually um, moved to San Francisco. Uh, then we have the, the Alcatraz Flyer, the Alcatraz Clipper, the G's Bend Car Ferry that was the first all electric ferry in the country for Aldot for the Alabama, Alabama Department of Transportation. We did the uh, spirit of the low spirit of the low country down in Charleston, which runs out to the uh, Fort Sumter National Monument. Uh, we did a uh, ship for um, U.S. Military Sealift Commands, kind of a civilian division of the Navy that uh, tracks Trident um, Trident missiles that are launched from submarines. Uh, we're doing a 
finishing up a project now at the University of Vermont, and we're, we're converting a uh, historic steamboat up for Mystic Seaport. That's a real fun job. And it's, it also, uh, it's connected me, um, the, the management at the seaport is also, uh, the management of Mystic Seaport is also um, a bunch of Kings Pointers. Uh, that's pretty much how I got the job, but I, I see some alignment between you know what I could do with all these different museums you know the mystic seaport as well as uh you know connecting resources from mystic seaport to uh you know the the seaport museum so I have all these ideas um the um okay maybe the, the next slide uh so that here's some just some fast facts uh, we plan to start service August 15th um we have one boat. We're just closing the sail on the second one. Um, we have a high-speed um, Lou and Mahal ferry that's currently at, at uh, Yank Shipyard down in southern New Jersey, just north of Cape May, getting a new interior and getting a fresh paint job. It's going to look like it's brand new when it's finished. Um, so we're, we plan to go to, to Pier 15 once we get the approvals um, from Hornblower, and then Hornblower gets the approvals from EDC. Um, significant reduction in Vehicles, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we're taking uh, you know buses and cars off the road by allowing the connection using the waterway. Um, we will not be serving alcohol. I know that's big for the community board. The run is the run is um, you know we're not we're not interested in being a bar. Um, the run is too short. Passengers have to be seated because they're high speed boats. So does you know alcohol and high speed boats don't mix. Um, absolutely no interest in serving any kind of alcohol on the boat. Uh, we're pr providing the bike racks on the boats. Um, we have clean, clean EPA tier three diesel engines powering, um, the first boat. And, um, we, we just hit, uh, an incredible amount of luck. Uh, the price of diesel fuel has gone through the roof. Uh, everybody knows what you're paying for gas now. Um, and, uh, a half a mile away in Elizabeth, there's a biodiesel refinery, a uh, half a mile from the ferry dock in Elizabeth, there's a biodiesel refinery. So we were able to run. Um, we're actually run, running Elizabeth's ferry service on Elizabeth's fuel, and we're, we're using um, um, biodiesel where the, the constituents from the fuel are, um, this, this refiner specializes in uh, uh, recycling vegetable cooking oil. So there's tank trucks and um, there's a railroad siding in there, it brings vegetable oil in on, in on tank trucks and processes it into, uh, into biodiesel. Uh, so then we're, we're um, you can't you can't put electric ferries into service until there's uh, a place to charge them, a terminal to charge them. Um, the terminals have to be specially designed uh, for the, the the loading of the power onto the boats with the right cable booms and and high current charging. Uh, so we we do tran you know our plan is definitely to transition to full electric vessels once we can establish the ridership and um, get the charging infrastructure. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in, a, in the next slide because we have a DOT grant in for it. Um, we have uh, the boats are about a 36 knot speed, so that allows connectivity. If if uh, even if we have to slow down a little bit, we can do the do it in about a 30 uh, 30 minute transit time. Uh, and again, we have the you know the the best case uh, transportation equity by connecting the two cities. Um, Jennifer Costa has really knocked it out of the park connecting the 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 EDC or the or the um, EDMO the the Elizabeth Tourist Organization with the uh, Manhattan Tourist Organization. So, you know everyone's trying to recover from COVID, and uh, you know we we did a um, a, a fam event for um, for uh, you know the tourism industry with 150 tour guides and travel agents. Uh, we pulled the the Atlantis, my my partner Fred's dinner boat. Into Pier 15 and simulated the run of the ferry over to Elizabeth uh, with 150 tour operators on it and uh, went over incredibly big. A um, lot of international travelers coming in, uh, tourists coming in um, from Newark Airport that you know want to enjoy the uh, the seaport and you know get to go by the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island on the way in. Um, okay, I guess uh, next slide. All right, so there's a picture of the first boat with its old old paint job. Um, where the last run um, is planned to arrive at 9:30 at night. And we're not running late night boats. Um, it's you know right now it's 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 just not in our cars. We don't think the 
uh, the ridership is there. We, we've looked at the schedules from United Airlines and, uh, and the mall, and we don't think, um, we, don't, we don't think it's necessary. We don't want to serve the bar crowd either. It makes a mess out of the boats. Um, so year round or heated, uh, we passed the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island and the skyline. We have a, a shuttle service on the other end to Newark airport. We're using the, we're, we're using the same uh, ticketing platform that NYC ferry uses. Uh, well, which brings up another point, the, the, our, uh, our connection would allow people to walk over, um, from pier level pier 11 to pier 15, um, like the ridership of, um, NYC ferry now has, uh, you know, a, a quick and sustainable way to get to Newark. So that was in the, it was in the interests of, uh, EDC to, uh, to locate us at, um, at pier 15. And we have a website. Uh, the website's kind of a placeholder right now. The ticketing system is about to go live. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, the ticketing system will have um, some other attractions to it. Um, you know, showcasing the the restaurants and everything. You know, what to do when you get here, type of thing. You think it'll also? It's um, the, the cool thing is it's you know Elizabeth views it as. The biggest, the biggest attraction in Elizabeth is Manhattan. And then, um, even the, the Manhattan hotels are, are contacting us wanting to, uh, um, wanting to know, you know, for their, for their, uh, clients, their customers, they want to, you know, offer the connectivity, um, into Newark as well. Uh, so I guess you hit the, hit the next slide. Okay. These are the births. Uh, the pier, the, there's, um, an uncovered uh, pier at the marina in in Elizabeth. Uh, we have we're having a temporary shelter being provided by the city, and then we have the shuttle bus to the mall and the airport. Um, it's about a five minute, less than a five minute shuttle bus ride to the airport, uh, a little shorter to the mall, and then pier uh, pier fifteen. I guess everyone's probably familiar. Everyone on this call is probably familiar with it. Um, the the beautiful thing about pier fifteen is it's covered. Um, you know, transportation resiliency was, was, uh, something we identified in the, the DOT grant. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so it has all of its benefits, you know, it's a block or two from wall street, right near the South street seaport near the museums. Um, it's also close to the subways, uh, you know, the ride share pickup, taxi pickup right below the FDR drive, uh. Uh, and it's again, it's it's next to Pier 11 with the 38 other ferries from NYC ferry pulling in there. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, maybe next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is just some views of the interior building. Uh, same thing, you know, it has the the uh, the walk up area, the promenade, has the New York City Park on the roof. Uh, pretty unique place. Great, um, wonderful location for international tourists to arrive, um, you know, and see, you know, bang, you're right in the seaport area, you know, a family, a fa family coming in from Europe, you know, it's just a, a beautiful spot for them to arrive. It's a real, Pier 15 is a real class act. Uh, so we're happy to have that, that relationship with, with Hornblower to be able to, to use it. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is, this is where it gets fun. Um, like I said, we, we can't start, we can't put large electric ferries into service because there's no place to charge them in New York Harbor. Um, so we, uh, we did a couple of things. We, um, worked with the city of Elizabeth to, um, um, apply for, we worked with the city planning and the city council and the economic development corporation. And, um, we, um, uh, they agreed to allow us to work with them to apply for a $5 million uh, DOT raise grant uh, that was filed. And the award date for that is August 12th. Um, that's to build a, um, it's a very unique project, very a project is large in scope uh, to build a new uh, electric ferry terminal at the Elizabeth waterfront, um, as well as a tunnel system. Uh, because of our electric ferry background, we were able to get the um, the interest of a, a tunneling company, and um, 
we, uh, the, there was difficulty in citing the, the electric ferry terminal at the Elizabeth waterfront because it's right smack in the, uh, in the confines of an existing city. And there's literally houses right across the street from where the ferry terminal parking lot would be. Uh, so we came up with a solution with the tunnels and that keeps all the, all the, uh, all the commuter traffic, all the, um, uh, all of the uh, shuttle buses and uh, uh, shuttle buses and everything away from those neighborhoods. There's literally like kids on skateboards and bicycles right across the street from where the ferry terminal is supposed to be sighted. So we came up with this unique approach, and uh, it, it made a lot of sense, solved a lot of problems. Um, so um, the uh, the tunnel system connects the airport. Uh, the Mills Mall and the ferry terminal, the Mills Mall parking lot, which is about a, a minute and a half in the tunnels, provides off-site parking for the ferries and has its own exit off the Jersey Turnpike. Um, so it's it's a you know tremendous opportunity. We got we got the blessing of Simon Malls to uh, to work with them for the development of the mall, and um, we're working um, with the Port Authority to land the tunnels in the um, in the airport. Um, so the, the solution offers a complete um, Newark Airport to New York City electrically powered zero emissions transportation system with a stop at the mall. So it's um, be the first electric ferry terminal in New York Harbor, uh, and, you know, and eliminate all the parking and traffic concerns near the ferry terminal. The route, the route is fully covered, uh, providing transportation res res resiliency. Uh, the, the tunnels. The, the ferry terminal, the boats, and Pier 15 are all, all completely covered. So in the event of a blizzard or something, there's uh, you know, everything stays clear. Stays clear. Uh, that was really big with the DOT, with you know the the storms, Hurricane Sandy, and all that. Uh, transportation resiliency. Um, the, the the grant addressed other issues on the New Jersey side, like the New York Jersey Turnpike overcrowding. Uh, that it's the Turnpike is something like 40% over its design capacity of of car volume. Um, the bus lanes are just completely jammed. They can't. They don't have enough bus lanes at all. Um, it, it addressed uh, the grant addressed sustainability, transportation equity, environmental, economic factors, and everything. And they're supposed to be award, awarded August. It's supposed to be awarded August twelfth. So, it'll be a major, uh, major step. Um, so, with the with the transport uh, from Lower Manhattan to Newark Airport, uh, the entire transport time would be about thirty five minutes. It's less than less than five minutes in the tunnel. Okay, uh, maybe next slide. Get some graphics of the. Uh, okay, um, one idea that 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 uh, I came up with, we're trying to find ways to unique ways to uh, um, make the business successful without the subsidies, and uh, the the airport being in the confines of Elizabeth is a blessing. And um, I've I've actually traveled to Hong Kong and Malaysia in my career fixing ships, you know, going to Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and um, over there they have um, uh, ferry services that use airport codes, and it's never been done in the United States. So what we're what we're like the end goal, uh, which will probably take a um, take a year or two after the ferry services started, you know, is to um, ticket passengers all the way to Lower Manhattan. Uh, using an airport code with no ground transport concerns, uh, so you could basically fly from LAX or you know LHR London Heathrow right to NYF, and uh, your baggage and yourself can be transferred um, to the uh, you know right directly to Lower Manhattan. Um, so that would open up um, you know the success of the ferry system and and uh, you know to the airline ticketing industry. So it it would seem to be a good business model. It's very very difficult to implement because we're trying something new, um, but that's uh, what we're you know what we what we're really um, trying to develop. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe the next slide. Okay, so this was an artist rendering of the the ferry route and the tunnel system, showing the connection from the airport. Uh, to the parking at the mall, and then to the Elizabeth City Marina. Um, it, it wasn't hard to convince Simon Corporation to allow us to use their parking lot because we're literally piping customers in from uh, 
uh, from the ferry and piping them in from Newark Airport. So it was um, quite, you know, uh, quite a unique, unique project. Um, and again, it's 100% um, from the uh, from the airport uh, through the tunnels and uh, from the ferry from the ferry dock in Elizabeth to Lower Manhattan would be completely zero emission, 100% done with electric vehicles. Got maybe the, the next slide. Okay, this is a, a, a drawing we had done of the, the potential um, ferry terminal at the, uh, at the dock in Elizabeth that actually looks like a giant E. Uh, the funny thing was the, the area was called E port before we even got involved for Elizabeth port. Uh, so it, the, we designed the ferry tunnel to look like an E and then it has the, uh, the lower promenade on the, on the first floor of the, uh, the terminal is where the tunnels come up. We've uh, um, worked with the boring company for everything about that. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, the modern high current uh, pantogram type automatic charging systems that they use in Europe uh, planned for the boats. Um, so it's a, it's just a, you know, tremendous blank canvas opportunity uh, finding, you know, the uh, Elizabeth, you know, on the water like that with a, with a major airport and, um, you know, connecting it, uh, it and its, its residents to, uh, uh, to, to lower Manhattan. Um, okay, maybe the next slide. I think that's we're getting to near the end here. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so I, uh, Jennifer Costa's contact information and, and my contact information are there. But that um, that that you know concludes everything. So I, I like to. See, I, I imagine you have a whole ton of questions. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for presenting. It's a very exciting project. So I congratulate you one on doing it and look forward to seeing more of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to start with a couple of questions. One, you talk about being able to take bicycles, which is wonderful. Is there going to be an extra charge for them to come be on board? Um, we, we reviewed the pricing of some other ferry operators, like um, uh, I think the C Street, the Atlantic Highlands operator charges five bucks per bicycle. We don't plan on charging for the bikes. Um, one boat is bigger than the other. We have a, a 250 passenger boat uh, that has a separate um, a separate room behind the pa separate compartment behind the passenger um, spaces behind the rows of seats. It's ideal for the bicycles. The second boat's a little smaller. Where we're going to have uh, exterior exterior racks or or possibly up on the sun deck. We just have to figure out how to get the bikes up there. Uh, but we right now we don't we don't um, you know I I, I see uh, we we want to put you know we want to put cheeks in seats. Um, and if they want to bring a bike, that's fine. We just, we just want to sell the tickets and carry, carry, and cover the base ridership. So we, you know, at a minimum break even, um, so that's that, and that those bike paths are amazing over there. And I think that's a major, particularly on weekends. It's an amazing, uh, amazing feature. So right now we don't, we don't plan on charging for bicycles. Can I ask, are, because I know New York city ferries are completely accessible. I. I'm a motorized scooter user, so of course I care about accessibility. So just a question, will these boats, these ferries also be accessible? Yeah, we're actually widening the doorways in the shipyard um, and, and, you know, to allow a full more than wheelchair width doors. 100% um, accessible, yes. Uh, wonderful. In fact, while you were talking about the bicycles, is there any kind of pricing that's known yet for this service? Um, yeah, we 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 do have a uh, we're still uh, broaching with um, with with Hudson County Union County. We're still talking with them about the possibility of of getting subsidized. But right now we have a a uh, a uh, fair price of somewhere between twenty four and twenty eight dollars one way. Again, you know, New York City, New York's NYC for completely private, completely unsubsidized. NYC ferry is, you know, obviously deeply subsidized to the point of it being the same price as a subway ticket. Yes, no, you, you're absolutely correct on that. Uh, and since I have a lot of people with their hands up, but I want to start with Lucian. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, uh, I have a couple couple questions. One is uh, the I I read on the website. Uh, I, I think on the website you mentioned 
uh, IKEA. Is that is that at the the Jersey Gardens Mall complex? Is that part of the city? It's the actually a complex? separate. It's another. It's another separate huge complex of its own, uh, right off the Jersey Turnpike. It's not. It's not in the mall like the mall property. It's not on the Simon uh, property. Okay. That's so, no problem. Um, and then the 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 shuttle that implies that that's included in the cost of the ticket, or is that additional to get to the airport? Um, it's going to be, a, we think it's going to be a $3 fare. Uh, there's a checkbox um, on, on the, on the anchor ticketing platform. Okay. Um, that if you need the shuttle bus, you check the box. Uh, if you need parking too, we're handling the parking on the Elizabeth side through that. Wonderful. Um, and then the last, last thing is um, just that through experience. Um, I know that the NYC ferries were designed with vertical bike parking for standard style uh, bicycles, but um, what I've observed and what I have often done is, you know, my family, we have a, a cargo bicycle. I can take both my sons on the back. Um, it doesn't go vertically easily, but it is a very substantial uh, 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 kickstand. Um, and so the, the NYC ferries actually parks those underneath the stairs in the front of the, the ferry. And you'll see a number of those uh, go back and forth. So it's just as a recommendation, um, you'll get more families if you can accommodate those family style setups um, for the yeah. biking and yeah, I'm all about that. Uh, I got two girls of my own. They're they're grown up and moved out, but I I get it. The um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. I I you know we have to figure out to do that how to do that on a smaller boat. I think it's just going to be a platform, a large platform off the back of the boat, um, or take take some seats out in the rear. Uh, but yeah, we see that. I mean, I'm you know I. Uh, I've ridden in Elizabeth several times. It's just it's just amazing over there, and I see that it's just just I just see the boat packed with bicycles. It's so it's going to be such a such a good link. Um, but yeah, I, I have to you know what I should do is actually ride uh, NYC Ferry with an eye to how they do the, how they handle the bicycles, like like ride NYC Ferry on a Saturday to see how they you know I, I need to you know really need to see how they do it. It's just a, just suggesting to, to to look at, but thank you. Seems like it's yeah. gonna be a great service. Yeah, thanks. Great. And before moving on, I I want to bring up something. I know it's you said it's in the future, but you talked about taking suitcases from the airport and then delivering them. But it was all at the Elizabeth side. Have you yeah. thought about doing anything at our end, the Manhattan end, where either suitcases are picked up or at least are checked in from the time they get to pier 15 all the way through to newark airport we have there's a whole there's a whole uh, myriad of stuff that goes with that um united has a service that we kind of were thinking of modeling uh modeling it against um if you if you book a united flight to allentown pennsylvania when you fly into newark they put you on a bus they put the the, the allentown leg is a bus and um, the way it works is it, when you're when you're flying in, your bags um, are checked directly to the bus, mm -hmm. and you claim them in Allentown off out of the bottom of the bus. Um, when you fly out of Allentown back to back to Newark, your um, you you carry your bags to the baggage to, to the check-in counter. You, you put your bags on the bus, obviously, but you you check them in at Newark. Um, so that what that avoids is the whole, you know, all the X-ray machines and, and everything on the dock. Um, that level of integration is possible, and it 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 uh, it would be a wonderful thing if we could make that happen. It would really be setting a setting a precedent. Um, but you know that I mean, with you know the TSA and everything, it's just that's just a huge undertaking. You know, um, I can't speak for United Airlines, and I I have no intent of of, of even even going there, but um, they're one progressive airline with a huge sustainability report. And, uh, you know, anything they can do to, to well, I guess I can say positive things about them, they wouldn't mind. But, you know, anything they can do to increase their 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 ease of passengers getting in and out of the city, um, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, venture to think they would do it. Again, I can't speak for them, but, um, so there's there's uh, and then and then the port authority as well. You know if you if you if you have if you have um, a way to make it easier for passengers to to um, eliminate ground transportation, all the all the emissions go with it. Right. 
you know, you use, you use just three little letters, NYF. I, I, I reserved NYF for New York Ferry. I couldn't believe it was available. Um, so that the downtown Manhattan could have NYF. Um, and it could be the, the first city in the country with that. So it's, um, you know, it would drive the ridership like crazy, be able to sell tickets on Expedia, um, you know, and connect people in there. And, and then, you know, all the, all the uh, you know, I, I think I think Newark Airport is just. I live out in Long Island, um, Northport, Long Island, and I, I I I just cringe if I have to go to Newark. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm glad you're thinking about it because one, I flew a lot, and I know these services are used by a lot of people. But I'm thinking of those also who work downtown. They don't really want to drag around their suitcase all day. If there was any mechanism where they could check it in and kind of be done with it. And then yep. join up with it in the airport, or even better yet, at the far end when they land. Yeah. That would be a big service for this population. Yep, yep, yep. Well, if you yep. scream for it, it'll help uh, help us. <laughs> Who do you want screaming done with? <laughs> well, uh, the Port Authority and um, United Airlines is by far the biggest carrier over there. There's 78 of 78 percent of the flights coming into uh, coming into the airport, and yes, they because they're know, based they, in Chicago. Yeah, but you know their hub is Newark. One, their, one of their one of their lar their largest hub is Newark. Yeah, no, my frequent flyer was for years and years and years with United. Oh wow! So yeah. I'm glad to hear you promoting. Them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. I will open it to the audience. So Bobby, I know you've had your hand up a long time, so I'm going to let you go first. But then Mimi, Cody, and Detta. Is my voice working? Yes. Okay, I think this is really an exciting endeavor you have going here, and we have been very interested in electrified ferries and net zero ferry systems for a long time, and all of the New York vendors haven't been able to do that, and so all of the estimates of when they'll be able to have soundless electric ferries is decades in the future. This transition from biofuels to European induction charging um, within the next few years is is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's also it also is a lot of evidence that you know how to do this, that you actually have those two ferries running in San Francisco Harbor. Mm -hmm. How long have they been running? Uh, since 2000, we converted them to hybrids in 2012 or 13. Uh, they carry literally thousands of passengers a day. Uh, and then we have the, the Fort Sumter Tours Ferry. 512 passengers has been running for about going on four years now. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we, we, we have to take very good care of the boats because it's, you know, if you want to be a leader, you got to stay on top. So you say that it's a sweet spot between the distance between uh, from Pier 15 to Port Elizabeth. So that's yeah. about how far. Uh, it, it's, um, I think 11 and a half miles. So it's no trouble for you to do that. And so do you think nope. that the similar kind of boats would be repeatable within reason at net zero that are electric in New York Harbor for the ferry services we have? Absolutely. But it's a, it's, it's a chicken or egg, you know, you need, you need the, you need the charging infrastructure to be able to charge them. Um, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I'd like to see, uh, I, I, I'm gonna, I don't want to start up too much stuff, but I'd like to see the, you know, the, the city embrace electric charging stations on the ferry docks, but, but, cause that's what I do. You know, that's, that's my business. Um, but, you know, it'd be a wonderful thing if it was, if it was embraced. Um, and I, and, and I, I would think that, you know, the, the, the volume of ferry traffic in the harbor that all these agencies have to be looking at it. Um, I, I kind of cringe though, you know, there's, there's other ferry terminals being built, um, you know, Carteret and South Amboy that there's no mention of electric. Well, I think that it's really important to go electric. And so you're a leader yeah. in that. And so anyway, yeah. we could support making you and your company a leader in that um, is really significant because you should be better known. The success of this should be uh, significant because even at 24 to 28 bucks, 
it really is a pretty efficient way to get to Newark Airport, even starting in Lower Manhattan. It's it's actually it's actually uh, reasonable. And so the the last little part of what I'm wondering about is I was raised in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and in the old days, oh, wow. uh, that part of Elizabeth Port wasn't wasn't considered uh, sightly particularly. And so. Uh, two questions. One is, do you have maps on on downtown Elizabeth and how it kind of? I know that the the Arthur Van the Van Kill kind of there's only half a block between the buildings, the kind of residential buildings and the and the and the and the docks. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't much. There's no place to park cars or anything. It's just right. a, you have right. enough. Uh, you mm -hmm. have, and so what you are going to do is you're going to put tunnels into a parking lot, which is pretty close to that is what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And, right. and then from the parking lot, you're going to have some kind of bus shuttle that goes to the goes to the airport and the mall. Yeah, there's there'll be the, there'll be electric vehicles used in the tunnels, um, connecting, connecting the uh, bringing the passengers through the tunnels or a stopover at the mall. Um, or continue directly to the airport, depending upon where the where the where the passenger is going. So you get a one vehicle, and it takes you either to the to the mall and the airport, or it takes you to the mall or the airport. Correct. Correct. Well, which one? Does it take you to both of them? Or it's um, there's an intermediate stop, and the vehicle could continue through the mall stop to uh, to the airport, or it could or it could stop if there's passengers getting out of the vehicle to go to the mall. Did you do anything about connecting it with Elizabeth in general? Because Port Elizabeth is a long way from Elizabeth Center and uh, where the yeah. city, where the yeah we have um, it's going to be coordinated with the city bus um, with the with the bus system there. You know we have there's a lot of integration when you do something like this. Um, so we we you know we have to uh, complete the integration of that. Uh, we have we have uh, you know all the restaurants and businesses in in Elizabeth very very excited. Um, but it's hard. To, it's really hard to get from that part of Port Elizabeth to any of those restaurants uh, yeah. if you're walking. I mean, a lot of New Yorkers would get there with no transportation at all, and it's not it's not yeah. easy to. Yeah, I know it's what you mean. It's, it's 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 at the bottom of Elizabeth Avenue. Basically, you have to get. Get up towards the top by City Hall before you start seeing any 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 of the uh, you know the real the real restaurants and activity. Um, we we are working with the City of Elizabeth to coordinate the, the buses and the shuttles to get to get people up there. And then also, you, it it could actually become a commuter connection if you can get to the if you can get to the train station in Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. I I really think this is a promising thing. If you uh, some weekend come downtown. We'd be glad to give you a tour of the ferries because we're we love them and we're expert. In them. Yeah, I'd like to like to do that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Amy, if you'd like to go. Sure. Yeah, um, a follow up question. Well, I guess it's a little bit of a comment. I feel that the baggage situation, it makes sense for it to be in New Jersey since uh, it, I mean, ultimately it depends on the ridership. Do you expect the ridership to be mostly airports or commuters or just tourists? Like, I i don't remember if there was a slide. I must have missed it. Um. No, I mean we do we do have uh, statistical information on that, and um, the um, I wish Jennifer Costa was free to do, to do this because that was her bag. Uh, she analyzed uh, the percentage of where the ridership would come from. Um, some would come from, um, you know, pass definitely passengers coming from the airport, uh, commuters, um, you know, people that don't want to want to um, avoid going into the tunnels. Um, and then the uh, the mall, the, you know, it, what we did is we looked at the statistics for New Jersey trans uh, transits ridership. There's eight uh, buses devoted to feeding passengers to the Mills Mall uh, every day. 
Wow. Um, just one stop from the from the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan to the Mills Mall. Um, so there's there's that. Um, you know, we'll get some of those buses off the road. Um, so it's a, it's a mix. You know, and it's it's for the reliability of business that mix is good for us because we'll have a base. You know, we may have monthly ticket buyers, which we have to treat like royalty, because um, that's our base customer. Yeah. And then and then we'll have um, you know we'll have um, business travelers that come in, you know, Wall Streeters that come in and want to have a meeting in, in down, you know, in the financial district. Uh, in the summer, we'll have um, tour the tremendous amount of tour groups that come in there. Um, they, uh, you know, we'll have we'll have organized groups, you know, of of tourists coming in that, you know, can, um, you know, uh, Elizabeth wants to or Elizabeth is actively marketing the seaport. You know, Elizabeth is Elizabeth's uh, Edmo group is connected with the Downtown Alliance, NYC Go, Howard Hughes Corporation, and the Seaport Museum. They're actively. Uh, Jennifer Cost is knocking it out of the park with those connections. You know, connecting the EDC, the um, tourism groups from two cities. Uh, so that that ridership, you know, it's going to be it is going to be a, a very varied ridership. I think, and it's going to change on weekends. You, you might have. Um, you know, a family from Elizabeth or from Union County or so from the surrounding area in New Jersey that wants to go to Central Park for the week or wants to catch dinner and a show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the you know, all lower Manhattans in you know in your area that you know the Oculus, the, the World Trade Center Museum, uh Statue Cruises, uh, you know, the Seaport Museum, all of that, all the attractions down in Lower Manhattan are all gonna be opened up to the tourism. Yeah. So the these um you said that but I'm scared, but I'm scared, I'm scared to death, Mimi, because this hasn't been done before. Huh. You're making an investment in a boat with no ridership history. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm uh, I'm literally scared to death. It's 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 gotta work. I mean, with the with the ridership the st statistics that we're looking at and the, you know, it, it looks like it's gotta work. And yeah, I'd love it, to take it to Newark. I feel like that would be um yeah, the best part, you know, because it's it's super hard to get to to the airports, like the yeah. the A to the whatever is just like it's like your whole day is gone, but um, 35 minutes to the airport sounds amazing. So the 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 buses from Port Authority, um, would there be a way to work with the mall to validate the trips and gain a discount for the people that want to stop taking the buses and then take the fare? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And and I'd be happy. It's that's you know. Keep in mind, we're ferry operators. We're we're the the marketing and that type of stuff is being handled by Edmo. Okay. Um, but the Simon Mall, uh, there's a woman, Crystal Fresco. I was I, she has the most refreshing name on the planet. But <laughs> anyway, um, Crystal is just amazing with the mall. She manages marketing for Simon Corporation specifically, just for the Mills Mall. And she's we're all over that. She's all that's going to drive ridership. You know. Um, you know, uh, take a ferry, get a discount book at the mall, or yeah. get get your uh, you know buy over you know a hundred dollars worth of shoes and get a free ticket or something. You know, there's there's um, definitely the communication is wide open. Uh, I, I, I've been talking to Crystal a couple of times a week. It's um, you know the most coveted contract for for uh, the carrying passage in New York, New York Harbor is the Statue of Liberty. Like people bid, you know, these ferry companies bid ruthlessly for that contract every time it comes up for renewal with the Park Service. And this mall has five times the passengers. You know, so it's it's got to work. You know, do you have a timeline for the the tunnel construction and the um, conversion from the biodiesel ferries yeah. to electric? Um, we have a very rough timeline. Um, August twelfth is the grant award. If we can get the planning done in a year, which would be monumental. Um, the the tunnel construction is surprisingly quick. It's only fourteen months. Hmm. Um, and then during that 14 month period, the, the terminal will be built out. So it's probably um, two and a half years. Awesome. You know, the time, you have, the time you have the planning, the planning grant gets awarded. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. the The drawings look like something out of the World's Fair. It's beautiful. So yeah, it's and a really cool cool, yeah, kind of kind of cartoony, but the artist was really cool. He was. He was I love cool. it. Yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm new at this, uh, but I just have, I have one question. 
Um, yep. It's about the charging infrastructure. Um, okay. Have you discussed with other ferry companies like Hornblower uh, the idea of um, coming together so that New York City sees charging infrastructure um, similar to what you're building in, in Elizabeth? Um, yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, the, the, um, the NYC, I'd be very careful what I say, because the, the, sure. the well, operates the ferry system for NYC EDC. Um, I did, I did, um, and it, I, I have to make sure, you know, Hornblower's, Hornblower's going to be on landlord for the pier. Um, but, uh, yeah, Cody, I'm all over it. Um, I'm, I'm, I am obviously the biggest proponent of it. Um, there's a lot to it. You know where you're going to site it, um, and how often they're going to recharge, and then the boats were purpose built as diesels. Uh, so it, so it's really, uh, it's you know, Hornblower is is my number one customer, and they are the most progressive and and you know environmentally minded company on the planet. Uh, so in that aspect, in that respect, uh, the city of New York has the ultimate partner to do that. Um, and I think I think it could be it 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 could be done. Man, my phone's going to be ringing tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I got to watch. I just got to watch what I say. I understand. But I mean, I, I, I'm all for it. You know, I, I'm, I'm of course I am. I'm, I'm I'm totally for it. You know, this is New York, and it's just you know the, the what are we what are we you know just, it just seems to me that the city would be incentivizing the idea of going. Electric, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's so much. There's so much, uh, you know, infrastructure money for clean stuff like this with the, you know, like this DOT raise grant, right. um, you know. So we're we're hoping uh, hoping for a successful award on August 12th to do it on the Elizabeth side, and we we have enough, you know, enough, um, you know, we can we can do like a, a round trip and a half on the battery capacity that we're able to load at the Elizabeth dock, so we don't need it in Manhattan, uh, but but. Yeah, by all means, we 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 want it in Manhattan. You know, I want to electrify Pier 15, but but I again, I I'm I'm not in charge of it, and I, I have you know relationship with a landlord that I have to have the utmost respect for, uh, and there's a, there's a process, and as you know, it's New York, it's a lot of red tape. Got it. But Thank but you. Yeah, I think yeah yeah. So. You're muted, Betty. Sorry. So, Cody, are you pushing to uh, try to get electrification in 15? So, say it again. Are you pushing to get electrification brought to Pier 15? Oh, I, I, I believe that would be wonderful. <laughs> like, because I mean, because I am. I mean, I mean, well, I think we're an island city, and um, the you know more and more ferries are transporting more New Yorkers and. You know, uh, they were all run by electricity. Sure, I mean, I don't know how that would work uh, as far as pushing for it. Well, you know? we'll we'll work on that for a future resolution. But my question to you, Mr. Brain, is: You had talked about Elizabeth being in a reasonable sweet spot for being able to electrify at the Elizabeth end and be able to go back and forth. If Pier 15 was electrified as well, I'm going to assume then. A bigger portion of New Jersey could be covered. Yeah, ferry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, we we have with with the present um, battery technology and the speed that we want to run at, we we can load the boat with about a trip and a half's worth of power at Elizabeth. So if we have the if we have the um, you know charging it at um, Pier 15, you know that it it can you know there's there's it. Now you have a jump off point. I mean, for uh, other ferries or dinner boats, it's not just ferries. It's it's you know every boat in the harbor is. I mean, the industry shifting that way. Uh, no question. And what I heard when we questioned the port authority about being more electric on the Hudson side, because we I am near the Battery Park City terminal, they said with the currents here, it was very difficult to have the battery storage to be able to handle the Hudson River with all electric. I don't know if that's true. That's just what they said. I, I, well, just to be honest, I completely disagree because that's even that's a that's a very short run hopping across the Hudson. Seems that way. 
Yeah. Anyway, thank you. And Tony, did you have something else to say? Just one more question about the, the charging infrastructure. Isn't it batteries, like large batteries that are char like charged over a period of time? I'm just. Um, Cody, what happens is every time I do, every time anybody, and not just me, but even worldwide, um, implements an electric ferry, the first thing that happens or the first thing that enters their mind after after they digest the fact that they're they're doing this, you know, they're they're, they're going to go electric, is where are you going to get the power from? Um, so the one of the cool things is it's just it's um, there's a whole nother industry that spawns itself off of off of implementing electric ferries, and that's the short side power infrastructure and the acquisition of the power uh, to to provide to the to the boat. Um, so uh, for instance, you could um, you know, get power from an off-site solar farm, use a community solar uh, arrangement through a utility company, and use use your own power that's generated off-site from your solar farm across the other side of the state and deliver it to your boat. Um, or you can, you know, put a put um, you know large uh, battery systems in, like Tesla Mega Packs. I'm implementing a Tesla Mega Pack out at Alcatraz um, to where you you um, store energy, you bleed power in slowly from the utility company and store it in the battery. And then you avoid all the demand charges uh, when you push it out rapidly to the boats, when the boats connect to the chargers. Uh, there's all sorts of, um, for the city of Glen Cove on Long Island, I'm involved over there, uh, we're creating a whole bunch of new jobs. Um, and I got the New York Power Authority under the Recharge New York program, uh, it's an energy for jobs program, to award them um, 800 kilowatts of discounted power for seven years from an upstate hydroelectric plant. You can't do any of that stuff with diesel. Diesel, you put liquid in a tank. Um, so there's, you know, you can have new wind farms off the coast of New, off the coast of New Jersey, buy the power, store it in a battery at the dock. You know, there's all sorts of options and and ways now to to really green it up. You know, um, and it's you know the we're, we're getting, we're getting busy. I love, I mean, I, I hate pulling my car up next to a gas pump, but it's the, the higher the diesel prices go, the, the more this looks, the more this gets better. You know? Thank you. Then let's have data go next. Data, you'd like to unmute? I'm trying to unmute. I'm trying to start my video. Okay, so do you have a website where you show the route and the times and the fares, or will you? We we definitely will, Detta. Um, the ElizabethFastFerry.com is the current website. Um, there's a little bit of information there. We're about to turn up the ticketing system, which will have all of that information. There's actually a link, a button that says uh, ticketing, and it says coming soon above the button. Uh, in the next uh, week or so, that'll go live, and you actually be able to buy tickets and see the schedule and everything. Okay. And what is it? What is it? Once an hour? Is it once and a half hour? Once every two hours? Um, we have a. It's about a uh, ninety-minute round trip with one boat. Um, the, our existing schedule has one boat, but we've just we just um, in the process of acquiring the second one, so we should be able to cut that interval time in half. And this, you said one boat's two hundred fifty seats, and the other smaller. What is how many seats on the other boat? One hundred and twenty-two. One hundred twenty-two. Yep. Uh, also, um, oh God. Sun Country is an airline. They're based out of Minneapolis. Really small, but they do do that service you were talking about for anyone 30 miles within Minneapolis St. Paul Airport, where it's the ground transportation and the baggage and the, and the priority check-in. Just you know, just if you want to look at another airline program of that for the future. What, not, what was not it? To confuse them, but just you know their model. Yeah, it was Sun Country you said? Yeah, Sun Country. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so, until the tunnel is built, how long does the shuttle take from the dock to Newark Airport? 
Um, it's it's a uh, less than a five minute, or right about a five minute ride over 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 all those crazy clover leaves over the turnpike over there. You know, when you oh, get to so it's, it's short. It's it's really short. Yes. I thought that yeah. was dependent on a tunnel being built. It's short anyway. No, yeah, it's short. It's short. Pretty much short anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I mean I'm very in favor of this, even with biodiesel even without the sustainability aspect, because the connectivity aspect by itself is fantastic. I think it's fantastic for uh, Elizabeth residents and for Manhattan residents. Great. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Oh, do you, so you don't know if you're getting the grant? You're still waiting to hear? Yeah, it's competitive DOT grant. It's, it's, uh, and it's funny too, you know, you have that, you have that, that narrow band of where you normally operate with, you know, how much risk you take. And this just like, you know, there's, there's so much to this because it's just like that band just went like this where there's now a tremendous elation if you win and a tremendous disappointment if you don't. So it's, um, that's where we're at where I'm on, I'm literally on edge and there's a couple, you know, several more months to go to find out whether or not we win it. But you're, just, uh, you're starting mid August. You're starting service regardless. Correct. The award date, it's going to be a very stressful week where, where the grant notification is August 12th and we announced the service start date of August 15th. So I'm going to be, a, that's going to be a very stressful week. I think, I hope you get the grant, but if you don't, there's other grants and your service could turn out to be profitable, you know. Yeah, yeah no, we're, we're, we're in the game. We're not, we're not giving up. You know, we got an incredible team on the, on the Elizabeth side and stuff and we're, 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 we're not giving up I and mean, the boats are going into service. Okay, great. Okay, great. And okay, we're at 730. Is Mimi, do you have new questions or is your hand still up? I can't hear you. I apologize. I, I don't have new questions. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Green. Okay. Yes, but, please, Lucian, you can finish it up. Yeah. So this is really quick, um, Mr. Green. Uh, have you spoken with the Howard Hughes Corporation about possible synergies with the Seaport, as they call it, the Seaport District? I have. I, uh, we've spoken to, on the marketing side, we spoke to uh, Ellie Chamberlain, um, who runs uh, pretty much the marketing for the Seaport. And uh, we've already had some guests. I had dinner with a year magazine at the Fulton Restaurant the other night. Um, that was, you know, I was helped out by them with that. Um, so it's starting, like the marketing machine is starting. Um, yeah, we, we want to integrate, you know, more and more that help, uh, help get the passengers in there. The, the connection, I just wish Jennifer Costa was on the phone because she's all over this, particularly Mimi, Mimi, you had some questions too. Um, she's all over this with, uh, you know, the, the, the development and the marketing, you know, tying all the, with the, EDC, with the, um, you know, tying her group at the, the Edmo group together with NYC go and with the downtown Alliance and whatnot. You know, um, well, I just specifically, uh, you know, they're pure 17. I mean, they have, they're essentially the ones who control most of the hotels in that, that area. Um, any, anybody coming from Newark airport to that district to stay in the hotels would probably be saving hours, um, of, of travel time, uh, yeah. uh, going to pier 15, but also, um, I imagine that they have lots of VIPs coming in. There's a television studio on pier 17. Oh, really? um, coming in in right. Newark, um, so that I think that there's probably a lot of save travel time um, just with with that node, that that uh, the business node. Then the last thing is, um, do you think there would be any um, there would be any weight uh, if Community Board One passed a resolution uh, calling on its elected officials to support this grant, including our, our, our you know elected representative Jerry Nadler? Uh. Can I like fall over with happiness on the call? <laughs> Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah, Lucian. Something for the community oh to god. consider. Oh my god! I mean, I want to hug you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm. Uh, yeah, uh, that would be absolutely tremendous. It, it, and it would it would not only do that; it would help us on some other aspects of the of the venture too, like you know, in investment and whatnot. You know, because we we have. Uh, you know, that we're doing what we're doing isn't isn't cheap. You know. Well, this, um, this board yeah. is on the record um, calling for electric ferry service 
um, particularly between points between Battery Park City and New Jersey. Um, and, um, you know, I know the Port Authority is, has inched towards that goal, um, though, you know, the progress is certainly not um, rearing any, uh, you know, probable results at this moment. Of course, there's, there's lots to do, but um, sure. we are on, on the record supporting this sort of thing. Great. Great. I was not aware of that. So that that's a separate um, separate support that you've already thought about. Yeah, the Battery Park City Committee has it has begun resolutions that the board has has supported, uh, calling for electric ferry service, um, and that's just you know almost based on not just environmental benefits but on noise reduction. Um, wow! Wow! Okay, okay, very very interesting for me to hear that. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll that's enough for me, Betty. Yeah. I mean. Oh, sorry, great! Lost, thanks. Sorry, I lost my composure there a little bit, but oh my god, that's that's just awesome. That's just awesome, Lucian. Thank you. Well, Jess, do you want to take on working on a resolution for this particular support of the DOT grant for further electrification? Yep, absolutely. So, how does that, Lucian, with with the with it with it? So, what is that like? Is that is if that a resolution you, that gets if this published? committee moves? If if this committee moves to um, vote on a resolution tonight uh, by the end of the month. The full board will consider a resolution. If that's passed, then I'll send that to all of our elected officials, including all of our federal elected officials. And I could try to find our DOT, you know, region two people and try to send it directly to them as well. Right, right. Lucian, if if it if I can ask, can you can you send me an email with what you just said so I can share with share it with the Elizabeth team? Well, I don't think only, gonna... I mean, I can, I can send it to you, but unless this committee moves to, to do it. Right, then... right. Okay. I'm jumping the gun. I'm, I don't want to jump the gun. I'm yeah. just excited. I'm very, very excited. Well, yes. And keep in mind that all of these are on our YouTube channel. So they can also look at the film. Oh, this, 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 um, this session is on. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's I have what to... I use for refreshers. Just so just so you know. Great. But that's also great. exists. If you want people okay, to look great. at it. So it'll uh, be like an couple of hours it'll be up there or something. That's right. Great. Christian, do you want to suggest some wording? Um, yeah, I mean, just based on what Mr. Breen said, um, I think you can just put it right to the, the raise grant and say, you know, community board one um, uh, supports the city of Elizabeth's uh, 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 filing of uh, for the raise grant. We could probably get some more Directed language, Mr. Breen, about that, um, particularly the amount of money, the ex exact amount of money, and um, just that it it dovetails with um, uh, other calls for the advancement of electric ferry service, serving Lower Manhattan, uh, and detailing um, some of the environmental needs, not simply air quality, but also um, sound sound pollution and uh, and and um, you know just not having fossil fuels. Spilling it to the water and the, and the like. Okay. And and uh, Betty uh, Patrick raised his hand. Uh, yes, and by all means, speak, Patrick. Yeah, I I just wanted to uh, point out as it, I don't know if it matters from the numbers perspective. My law firm represents the Hornblower Group, so I'll have to recuse myself, unfortunately. Um, though I'm personally very supportive and encourage everyone to support a resolution. I cannot vote in f one way or the other. Okay. Okay. I'm looking, we still have quorum, so that should be okay. Well, what do people think about voting given the wording? What we're really all we're doing is supporting their grant for electrification. It's no broader than that. Um, so it's narrow. I'm very supportive of that resolution. Same. So should we just move forward with move to vote? Okay. Okay. Lucian, if you'd like to take a vote. Sure. Um, I have Patrick recorded as recused. Any opposition? Any abstentions? Hearing that, it passes. Great. Then we'll put that together. <laughs> Jess, you're on it. Now I know that Cody, you're a freelance writer, so you're going to be recruited for Rezo writing soon, too. <laughs> so yeah, thank we you can, very much. We all for work you. together on that. Yeah, no, it sounds fascinating and very supportive of what you're doing. So we're thrilled to be able to write a resolution and you'll see a copy of it when it's done. Amazing. 
Amazing. I, I had no idea it would go this well. I really thank you all. <laughs> just wow. Wow. Hey, you're welcome. And in fact, just to let you know, the full board meeting where they will vote on the resolution is on the 28th of this month. So we wouldn't know the answer about full board until the 28th of the month, which is a Tuesday night. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. And the next one, because I'd want to hold up Carrie Davidson is here from Friends of Dwayne Park. So I want to make sure that she's unmuted or move to the oh, panel or something. Over. Okay, so I'm dropping off everybody. Thank you. Yeah, Have a good night. Again. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Okay. You're able to unmute and put yourself on video if you wish. Oh, why not? Hold on. Yes, and let me know if you want someone to share your slides. Um, I gave them to Lucian, so um, and that was, I'm so glad right that now. I went third tonight because that was fascinating, and I'm super excited. There's like, anyway, that's, um, so anyway, you have a lot to do, so I will get right to it. Um, Lucian, will you share my slides? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No, no, no. I've, I've got it. Okay. You're the best. Okay. So, um, many of you I have met before, although I haven't always had the pleasure of having my video on. So, this is very exciting. Um, but Friends of Dwayne Park is an all uh, volunteer board. And this is just a snapshot of our website so that you get a sense of um, this is our, our mission. Um, and we are a board of uh, 15 people, and then we have um, groups of volunteers who work on special projects that are another, you know, 15 or 20 strong. So we're a, a decent sized group, um, firmly committed and embedded in the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. So Dwayne Park is, um, I might get pushback on this, especially if you live near Bowling Green, but Dwayne Park is the city's first public parkland in New York City. It is not the oldest park. It is the second. Bowling Green is older, but Bowling Green was not a public park. It was a private space. And so ours is actually the longest serving public parkland. Um, and it was set aside specifically for park like use when the city bought it from Trinity Church in 1797 uh, for five bucks. Next slide. So if you if you do the math, you realize that it's our 225th year, uh, not as the friends, but as the park itself. And um, and along the bottom there, you see sort of the timeline uh, for those of you who uh, to whom I've made this a, a presentation about our restoration project. Um, this is the timeline that goes from on the far left. The first planning at the top of the circle, you can still see that uh, the old Dutch farm wasn't even mapped yet. Um, in 1890s, the, the buildings get built and the, the park gets changed over time. The middle is 1940 when uh, Moses thought that parks meant concrete and low maintenance. So that's that era. Um, the, the two here on the, um, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. You can't see my, my cursor. Um, the Signe Nielsen designs, the uh, far to right designs, you'll see a small change in the park's shape. Thanks, Lucian. And you'll see that um, uh, what that shows is that there's a longer western nose and the addition of a tree because over time the, the DOT or, or the city uh, sort of nibbled off the edges of the park. So there is also a restoration project to restore it to that original historic footprint. Uh, so I had to just get that plug in for the restoration project. Uh, anyway, uh, the math is it's 225 years since the land was set aside for public park use. Um, we have a bunch of events to celebrate that, um, our music series and things like that. Um, but our big event is a culminating outdoor celebratory dinner this fall. So next slide. So this is why we're here. Um, on September 18th, our plan is to close the street and build a community table 
Um, we've, we've got the logistics, we think, to do it successfully for 150 people. Um, and the idea is to bring the neighbors together and uh, we have a historian who's going to give a little history and, um, and we're going to celebrate this great piece of public park. Uh, so it's the 225th anniversary and September 18th, we filed an application to close the street uh, to have a one day uh, street application, street activity permit application. Next slide. So this is just sort of a an idea. Um, I can't name the restaurant partner yet because the contract is not signed, so I won't be able to do that. But it's um, very exciting. Um, we're going to have a meal. We have partners in restaurants in the neighborhood to help us with this, and uh, including Dwayne Park Patisserie and Tribeca Wine Merchants. Next slide. Um, we have. Um, American Express and Amy Bergman Bonamy of Compass are lead sponsors. Um, if I went back to the, uh, well, you'll see in a minute, but American Express is purposefully chosen uh, because they were a, um, a key tenant surrounding the park back in the 1890s, which is when most of the buildings around the park went up. Uh, and Amy Bonamy is just a, a friend and lead presenter, lead sponsor of the park. She's been very um, actively um, supporting the park for many years. Uh, so we're grateful to her. Uh, and the next slide. So here's the, um, the ins and outs. So we filed a street activity permit uh, application. Uh, the, oh, not, not yet. Go back one. Go back. Thanks. Um, the SAPO application is for the street closure. So you'll see that um, when you file for a SAPO a street activity permit, the map only shows your primary street, um, but we would be asking to close uh, both Forks of Duane and Staple um, because we're gonna close it at Greenwich Street in order to get the table to run the full length. So, um, so it's closing both Forks of Duane Street and Staple Street so that people can't drive their cars you know, in the back way and, and injure somebody. Uh, the street closure um, permit request is from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That gives us time uh, to set up the tenting and various things. Uh, not too early is to disturb people, and the breakdown will start by 9 o'clock and be done by 10. Sidewalks will remain open, so um, the public can, you know, come through um, along the sidewalk, so businesses can still serve patrons and all of that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll use uh, wristbands and things like that to know who's to be seated at the community table. Um, there will be amplified sound. We'll have a permit for that. It's not loud. It's not huge. It's just a, um, a historian, um, you know, and some background music and some toasts. Um, we've notified all the local businesses and residents, and there have been no object objections to our plans. Um, most people are super excited and want to start buying their tickets, um, but we don't want to start selling tickets until we know that we have um, all of our I's dotted and T's crossed and our street activity permit in hand, or at least no objection to granting it. So that is the first part of why we are here. The second part is, next slide, is uh, a, a banner program application. So as part of the um, celebration of uh, the 225th year, we chose this particular image because it shows the park in the 18, um, 80s, 1890s, when most of the buildings surrounding the park were built. And the design that is shown there is, um, uh, anyway, it's a Parsons and Box. And anyway, you can go to our website if you want to read all the history. I won't go too much into it. Um, but on the right of that building is the former Amex Depot. And ironically, Amy Bonamy of Compass lives in the building that's presented. So it was just kind of shared. Um, so we are, uh, we've submitted a banner application to put this banner on the three uh, ornamental lampposts that are in Duane Park. We applied for a one year time period with a start date of June 1st. And um, again, just like the SAPO permit, we are seeking a resolution of support for the banner 
application. I think that might be my last line. Can you forward one and just, let me see, Lucian. Oh yeah, that's, okay, so here's the permitting timeline. Everything was filed, uh, both applications were filed April 29th. There'll be a catering permit that deals with the alcohol. Um, if we have to do a one day, either way, we'll go to the licensing and permitting group if we need to. Sound permit is already completed. It goes to the police department, um, first precinct 30 days in advance, and there's our pricing. So that's, that's the last slide. Um, so anyway, so what I'm asking for, what Friends of Dwayne Park is asking for is a uh, resolution in support of our street activity permit and our banner. That's it. Great. Thanks, Gary. Are there, I don't see any hands. Are there any questions? Because I have some wording you can vote on, but Eric, please. Yeah, so so for this uh, street closure application, it's 10 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. That's approximately 12 hours. Yeah. And I saw the table. So what other activities will there be during that time frame? Um, well, so the that's the maximum amount of time that you can get for your um, street fair, your one day street fair permit. So um, it it's take it's we take the full time for the closure. Um, it'll probably the short answer is I'd love to program it during the day for families as well, but everybody says I'm over committing, taking on too much to have simultaneous events for families with children while they're setting up tents and mobile kitchens. So um, I wanted to have a brunch followed by a community dinner with all kinds, but I tend to be, that's who I am. So we're, uh, we're gonna keep it a lift that we can manage and we're gonna do the one uh, community table. We do have a bunch of um, free family events. So not every, it's not that we're just fundraising. Um, so we have a music series, uh, low amplified music on Thursdays. It starts to, uh, this week and it's every uh, second and third Thursday of the month. So those are all free and they're, um, Church Street School is performing, kids from Little Red, um, I think Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Friends, and then, you know, Sammy Buttons, there's various people. Anyway, it's all on our website. Okay, um, my, my other, my, my last question is, so with this with this street closure, will, will peep, anyone be able to walk through it or, okay. Yes, yes, we're not, we're not preventing the public from being there, um, but you won't be served a dinner. You won't have a seat at the table. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. If you want to hear the historian talk all about Dwayne Park, for sure, Eric, you should come. Okay. Yeah, and Carrie, do you think you want? The sidewalks won't be closed at all. No. Mm -mm. no. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, if you go to the slides, I have some wording you can vote on for the resolution. I'm going to beg you, Jess. Uh -huh. See that? Yes, I can see it. Can everyone else? That's very nice. <laughs> As you can see, we're asking to support both of the permits. The one to approve this the street permit that will allow them to close Greenwich Street. Uh, sorry, to close Dwayne Street between Greenwich and Hudson Street. I need to add in there the Staples, so I'm glad you mentioned Staple Street. Thank you. Uh, so that we support the permit application for the banners on the historic lampposts because the DOT requires a separate permit for that. And I have spoken with Christopher Marte and he is on board with uh, helping to shepherd some of this through, but this again formally asks him and I promised him he would get this after this meeting. So any comments, questions? All the question. I'll second it in Lucian if you'd like to take a vote. Do I hear any um, anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Any recusals? Hearing none, I uh, believe this fat motion carries. Great. Well, thank you, Carrie. And I will change the wording to include to Staple Street. Terrific. I appreciate it. And one other small correction. Um, they are uh, historic ornamental lampposts. Um, the DOT uses that language. 
Um, so just ornamental lampposts. I don't know if it's important or not, but it is the term they use. Uh, I'll use their words. Yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate the support and uh, welcome to Cody, who's I believe a new member. And um, thank you. I will. I I I tend to um, follow this committee closely because the issues are important, and I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. So thank you very much. Thank you, and good luck. I look forward to. There are a lot of people looking forward to the event. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. We can go to the next slide. Because I think now everything's really internal. There is no external speakers for the rest. Uh, and so I'm going to turn this over to Jess because he was kind enough to work on this resolution. Thank you, Betty. So, so let me just fix my headphones here. Yeah. So this is um, this resolution is regarding a, a bill that was recently introduced, um, one that I imagine many, if not all of us, will be excited about. Um, this is a, a bill to prevent city agencies from issuing any more parking placards. Um, there are three exceptions. There, there are for elected officials, uh, people with disabilities, or any parking permit issued pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement. Um, as far as we know, um, the Department of Education is the only one that has parking as part of their collective bargaining agreement. Um, there's no official accounting of this, but I know that the NYPD does not. I'm not aware of any other law enforcement agencies that don't, but there is no official accounting, and it seems that no one really knows the answer for sure. Um, but in addition to preventing city agencies from issuing them in the future, um, it would also revoke all existing city issued parking permits. Again, there is no official uh, accounting of how many there are out there. We've seen a lot of different um, estimates, and the one from Lincoln Ressler who proposed this bill is that there are 60,000 out there. So all those would be revoked. Um, I mentioned here that Councilmember Marte is a co-sponsor, which is great to see as we've brought this issue up many, many times in the past. And of course, um, this is an issue that is regularly cited by us, by other community boards, by elected officials. Um, so Betty and I wrote up a few statements of resolve, um, pretty simple, calling for passage of this bill by the city council, urging Eric Adams to sign it. And uh, in addition, urging Mayor Eric Adams to uh, resist the urge to enter any collective bargaining agreement in the future, which would grant parking permits or other parking privileges to private vehicles. Because, you know, obviously once this, this loophole is in place, we can imagine that people are going to, uh, city employees are going to start asking for it during collective bargaining. So um, we would like to get out ahead of that um, and call on the mayor not to do that. So that's what we put together. Um, any, any questions or thoughts? I see no hands. This is, I expected, a very popular one. Yeah, well, you want <laughs> actually, to just had, I just had one quick question okay, about that about that loophole, Jess, and I'm wondering yeah. whether um, the council member's representative can speak to it. I haven't looked at the. I read news reports about this, and you know, did a happy dance, of course, uh, but I haven't read the language, and I'm I'm wondering if there's a way to to achieve what. And by the way, we should keep that second, therefore, be it resolved. But I'm wondering if there's a way to achieve that by amending the legislation to include the words current collective bargaining agreement. So, in other words, the only exception would be where there's an existing collective, existing being better word, I guess, than current, existing collective bargaining agreement so that it doesn't apply to future collective bargaining agreements. That's an interesting idea. Um, the only problem I'm thinking of is that they, the collective bargaining agreements will expire. Right, so yeah, right. So that op that opens up the problem of now you're saying that all all the school employees that once it's over, it's over. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting idea because you're right. It, it's a, it's a pretty big loophole because people, like I said, employees mm -hmm. are going to obviously start asking for it. Yeah. All right. Well, you're so right I'm glad you have two talk. lawyers fighting over this one. Jess, <laughs> 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 Jess is right. Yeah. Okay. So. You're saying that we're better off to leave the wording the way it is because the other just kind of won't work anyway. Yeah. Okay, well, given the wording then, uh, Eric, since your hands up. Yeah, um, uh, Jess, would, would you go back to that original, the previous screen where it. It showed the proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think this is 
using a sledgehammer. I, I think this is it's it's too severe. This 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 pro proposed law. I mean, can can you go back to the exceptions? Yeah, they're they're just right here in the first paragraph oh. here. So elected official plays for people with disabilities or collective bargaining agreement. That's it. So this would prevent city agents from issuing park to private vehicles, but. Look, I don't have one. I'll never get one. I'm, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm 100% sure, but we don't know what they needed. Sometimes they expect people to. To respond to certain places, I, I think. There should just be a, a high standard before they issue it. I mean, I, I understand. I agree with the elected official license plate. But then. For disability, I, I think it should be a high standard. Of a disability verified by multiple part, you know, multiple doctors, I, I, I think, and this law would revoke all other city issued parking permits. I, I think for private vehicles. Private vehicles for private vehicles. I, I think this is, yeah, things are a problem with with um, abuse of city placards. But to say that we would revoke this would revoke all other city issued parking permits. I, I think it, we just need to get a full account of how many there are. I, I heard somebody mention that. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I think that's the problem. I, I think to, to revoke something and to say that we're not going to allow it anymore, uh, if, unless for a disability or current collective bargaining agreement, I, I think is, is, is extreme. Okay, well, this this is just I'm correct. This is the law, so it's a matter of just voting up or down. Whether you yeah. support the law, or you don't support the law. Correct. Yeah, I mean, we can suggest amendments to the law, but yeah, this is this is the proposal. Oh, you mean bill? So this is the bill proposed. This is the bill, bill. right? Thank you. Thank you. Right. So if you call a vote, all the question. Second. Sure. Okay. So, um, do I hear any votes in opposition? Uh, that's me. Okay. I have you opposed. Uh, any, anyone else? Any abstentions? Any recusals? Okay. With that, the motion carries. Great. Thank you. Great. Lucian. And if anyone has ideas about the, um. The collective bargaining issue definitely let us know because something I've been thinking a lot about that's definitely going to be something we're going to hear about again. <laughs> I have no doubt. Um, yeah, question. I mean, I, I think I think it's my my mind. I think it's mostly UFT. You know, you, um, yeah, the, the teachers union. Um, they're the ones I I know that they have a a very strong uh, parking placard relationship with the city, and I know that the former mayor. Um, reversed what Bloomberg did, you know, they, right. they, I think there was like an actual collective bargain number of placards for each school. Mm -hmm. And then he just went ahead and gave, gave everybody one, uh, despite, um, that agreement. So I know there's a lot of kind of play at that, you know, around that point. Um, this, from my read, the bill does not limit the city's ability to, uh, validate someone's parking if they are using their vehicle. Um, in service of the city and they have to pay for parking. Um, so I think that is still um, something the city can do. Um, and that's something that we can, we can get a little bit more clarity on as well. Right. And this is also an introduction of the law, which doesn't mean it might not be modified within the process of what goes on at city hall. Right. But Lucian, you finish the vote. And we can yeah, move on. Yeah, the motion carries. Great. And I think Jess, did you have this one? Or is this also one of the ones I did? Yeah, no, I, 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 I Yeah, I drafted this one. So I can Great. I can go ahead. Take this. Um so another um proposed law, this is one by uh council member Robert Holden. Um, this would change the process by which the Department of Transportation notifies affected community boards of changes in their projects in their um, in their district. So under the under the current 
framework, the Department of Transportation only has to notify a community board um, for, quote, major transportation projects. Um, and so this law would, would do a couple of things. At first, it would change the definition of a major transportation project to include uh, bus, uh, any change to a bus lane, a bus, a busway, or a bike lane. Um, notably, it would be for any change for any bus lane, busway, or bike lane, it would, regardless of the size of it. Currently, it has to be a certain amount of city blocks or a certain amount of uh, feet, but this would be anything. The second thing it would do is it would require the Department of Transportation to uh, provide a presentation of any such plan to the affected community board within 30 days. Um, currently, they only have to do it if, if the affected community board requests a meeting. And then afterwards, it would give the community board 60 days to provide recommendations or comments. Currently, it's only seven days. And then finally, and I think this one's pretty uncontroversial, is require the Department of Transportation to post quarterly progress reports on its website for any of these projects. And at a minimum, it would requ require that progress report to include information on the date of completion of the project and information regarding opportunity for community members to provide input on the project. So in thinking through this, uh, Betty and I had a couple of issues that we wanted to flag and concern. As I said, currently the Department of Transportation is only required to notify the effective community board of quote major transportation projects. And as I said, there's a, a formula in there for how many uh, street blocks it has to affect or the distance of, of how long the project has to be to trigger the notification requirement. Um, so under one unintended consequence of this is that under this bill, if the Department of Transportation wants to do something as simple as put a bike lane on a single city block, they are going to be required to notify the affected community board and then within 30 days provide a presentation and then wait 60 days for uh, comments. So all in all, that could be up to 100 days or over three months uh, to just build a bike lane or put in a, a busway on a single city block. Um, so, you know, while we agreed that the, the current seven day comment period is unworkable given just scheduling constraints of community boards and how community boards operate, um, this notification process and the expanded timeline could have the unintended consequence of really delaying projects and uh, possibly disincentivizing the Department of Transportation from even wanting to propose these projects to begin with. And in conjunction with that, that we are thinking was that the requirement that COT presents for every major transportation project is pretty unnecessary. And, um, you know, like I said, if you're putting a, a bike lane on a single city block, it's probably sufficient that you notify the community board. And if they want a presentation, they can request one. But if no one wants it, no one requests it, there's no reason to have to wait that that 30 day period and then wait for the 60 day period to get commentary. So uh, we propose sort of a, a little bit of a convoluted um, statement of resolve here um, with three parts. The first is to say that we support the expansion of the notification process by including the construction or removal of bus lanes, busways and, and bike lanes as major transportation projects. We see no reason why um, the Department of Transportation can't simply notify community boards of these projects. That seems uncontroversial. Um, but second, as I was saying, we have a concern about the time frame for this notification process, and we proposed expanding it a little bit, but not as far as this bill would do. So we said 30 days after a presentation, if a Department of Transportation uh, presentation is requested, and if no, DOT presentation is requested, and 45 days after notification to the affected community board. Um, and then in conjunction with that, of course, we also state that we don't support the requirement that DOT provide a presentation in every instance and suggest amending the bill so that the Department of Transportation is only required to provide a presentation when one is requested by the affected community board. So a little complicated, but um, interested in everyone's thoughts here. Or question. Eric? Yes. Uh, my comment and question is this works fine for, for when the DOT is doing a project that will be performed by in house forces. 
But if they have a contract that's awarded, whatever specifications are put into the contract saying, let's say we're going to, in order to repair this street, you know, this capital project, and it says that the contractor is entitled to one year closure. And, you know, let, let's say the, the, the scope of work justifies it. By time the the DOT presents it to the community board, it's it's already codified, it's already in the contract, and there's no change that that or that could be made. It it's set contractually. I I think this works well for for when it's being done by in-house forces, but the community board should be notified before a contract is awarded. Otherwise, there's no point. It's just notification, and and nothing can 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 be changed because it, it it'll affect the contractor's cost structure and their schedule. Yeah, that's that's interesting, Betty. Do you think that that's maybe something that we should take up in a in a different resolution? Because again, this one's just about um in a uh, an existing proposal, so it's sort of an up well, or down thing. Here at Lucian, he usually has enlightening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Eric makes a really good point about the the the, the value of pre-planning and, and and working with the community um, to um, build a plan um, so that it's not as, as much of a surprise um, because it's true that um, you're really only and this goes with land use too. You know, when the administration tries to come and you know drop a project, sixty days is good for review, but the best you're only going to do is change. Things at the margins, so I do think that you know it, it. It probably wouldn't hurt to say, you know, the best way to communicate the community is to work with the community and building a project from the ground up. Um, that you know, notwithstanding, um, I do think 45 days is the sweet spot. Um, 60 days is appropriate for land use because it does uh, take a lot of time for question and answers, but for transportation projects, um, you know, I think 45 days. It's always better than 30 days. 30 days never works for our cycle. They always tell us sometime, you know, in the middle of the month, and then it doesn't. It just doesn't work for the way that we need to do things. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I agree with 45 days, but I do think that it is worthwhile to encourage DOT to work with us earlier um, in the the gestation of the project itself. Okay. Yeah, we 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 can add that in, and I mean, if it's something we want to take up. More comprehensively later on, I think that's a good idea too. Um, so, well, I think just that's the issue. Does it belong here because this bill is what the bill is, or is that really a separate resolution to encourage the DOT to work more closely so the input can be at the appropriate time? Yeah, hi. This, I just want to say something. Uh, the language has to be before the contract is awarded, because once it's awarded, it's it's finalized. But this law doesn't address that. So if, if it's saying notification of a major construction project, so doesn't that, that means that the project's already been awarded and, and it will, it will happen, right? Lucian, do you have an answer? Or insight? Uh, I had to read the legislation to see what, what sorts of, the, what, what they describe, what sorts of things, um, qualify for this uh, bill, a major transportation project, uh, alter four or more consecutive blocks. I mean, it. I don't know where that falls in procurement, um, yeah. if they've gone to procurement yet. Um, it's, it's not I would, I would say we'd have to really dig into that, um, but you can make that clear in the whereas is, and therefore resolve to say that, um, you know, this, in, this really sounds like it's intended to be done before the city goes into the procurement process if it's not being done internally. Um, if there, uh, because I do think Eric's point is is salient here, um, because that that really does matter for this bill. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not quite clear from from re I'm reading the bill right now. It's not quite clear. It does say if an if an agency of the city other than the department impl implements a major transportation project, then that agency has to provide notice. But it doesn't say anything about if it's not the agency. So 
we can. I would say also that we've seen, you know, there's the there's the DOT in-house, you know, thermoplast kind of you know job where um, they probably have you know some contractor who's on retainer that has a you know a, a already has a contract for you know to, to put these sorts of things down across the city, um, and then when it's a you know when the project ages into permanency. They do a DDC, you know, style reconstruction of the street to move the storm drains and, and the like. Um, there, there, there. It's very possible that there's, you know, something in between. Um, I'm, I'm no expert on DOT's uh, procurement or, or construction. Um, you know, I've learned a lot over the years, but I do think that it's very possible that they, they may do something with procurement. And I think it's just, it's, it would be good to make it clear that uh, if they're coming to the community boards because there's still time to take feedback and, and make real changes um, if they if they if the community board really points out something material. Okay. But you're suggesting it as a whereas still solution, correct? Uh, I, I mean I would set up, you know, it's like set up with a whereas, but I would I would say that um, if this bill doesn't make it clear then it would be good if we asked for it to be clarified um, to gain the support of the community board. Um, if that's what this bill is attempting to do, is to, to create real opportunity for feedback, a touch point for feedback for these major projects, then it would be good to, to have that, that, uh, that lead time so they could um, take that feedback without having to do a costly change order or even being able to change it at all. So you would add another statement to the therefore be it resolved? If, if yes, if this is what we're, you know, if this is what the bill is intending to do, then yes. I have a mess of notes here. Uh, <laughs> and that would be to get the bill to clarify that in fact, the contact that they're talking about the notification time is pre procurement. Yeah, a pre procurement or that the, 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 the agency is prepared to, you know, make significant changes if the community board, you know, raises a, a key issue that needs to be addressed in the project. I mean, in reality, no project should be so far along that someone making a really important point can't change the project if absolutely necessary. But if they're going to come to us, it should be to guide the the design to some degree, and and not simply just to say here it is and and uh, move on from there. If that's the point of this bill, if it's just to say that they talk to us before they go ahead and do it then the bill really doesn't do anything other than just kind of create a, an extra step. Uh, also, if, if, the, if the contract's already signed, uh, the agency can, can modify it, but there'll be a, a, a cost, a penalty. So that's the real disincentive for any change after the project's awarded. Thank you, Eric. We hadn't hadn't thought of that, so thank you. Um, Cody, you want to go ahead? It's, I just wanted to understand. Um, I'm trying to understand the the. So you're saying a bike lane, in other words, just a strip of paint, you know, is is part of, you know, is being called a, a major transportation project, the same as moving sewer drains. I mean, does does, you know, the does do do. Does the, you know, is the time period to, um, to speak about this? Is it, you know, to the community board for the community board to respond to um, um, a, a bike lane with, that's just a strip of paint? You know, assuming that it is, does that get grouped into the same? I mean, are we talking about the same thing? And you know, as far as transportation projects, I'm just trying to understand. Cody, the 
the way the bill is written, it says it defines a major transportation project as encompassing four blocks. So it could capture, you know, a class two bike lane, you know, where they are just marking and, right. and, and moving the, the curb lane out um, or, you know, the parking lane out uh, a little bit. But if that's also the case, then there really isn't much procurement issues for them. They, they can make changes quite easily to the designs and we've seen that happen. It's probably something where um, you know they're 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 going to be you know breaking concrete, so to speak, and uh, maybe for like a, a protected bike lane or or something you know more involved than that, where there may be you know an outside vendor where they have to have a special contract for it. Right. But that's that's you know they, I think that's why it's important to make the distinction. Um, you know, either try your best to do it before. The contract is set, so you have time to, you know, make any changes. You come early enough where you're not saying, "Well, the contract signed, so we can't change it," or, um, you know, change it if it's a really significant issue, um, which is not great because you know a change order raises the cost of any kind of transportation uh, uh, project, and that's what we see, like you know, Second Avenue subway. Uh, east side access, these costs explode because of all the change orders that go in. Um, but of course, at a smaller scale, at a DOT scale, I don't think it's it's going to you know be breaking the bank, so to speak. But I think it's important that if they're going to have a bill where they're forcing DOT to come, um, that it's a it's a meaningful it's a meaningful uh, consultation with the board, and not simply just forcing them to come. Uh, when everything's already done, because then people are going to spend all the time to come talk to them, and then they're going to say, "Okay, that's great, uh, but nothing's going to change about the project," which is the point of community boards. We're supposed to provide them with meaningful uh, feedback that they could then disregard oh. if they want, or oh, well, say that it's not significant. Excuse me, yeah, Jesse, we we, we see your screen. <laughs> just to let you know. Okay, all right. Sorry, I just didn't want to say that. So the, the 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 sweet spot you're saying is 45 days, right? Um, but just in terms of like from the from the from the time of notification, when DOT comes to me and they say, "Hey, look, um, we got this thing." Like for example, uh, we want to do somebody wants to do revocable consent to put a ramp on the sidewalk, uh, and they tell me on June 15th, I'll say, "Well, I have 30 days." In 30 days from now, it'll be July 15th. I will have had time to calendar it at my next transportation committee meeting, but the, we won't be able to make it to full board to pass the resolution uh, officially by your 30 days. So I can't get this to you in time. Uh, and that happens all the time. Now, luckily, DOT is cool and they say, okay, well, just get it to us when you can. Uh, at least those divisions are pretty cool about it. But if they wanted to be real stinkers about it and say, sorry, 30 days is 30 days, that's not enough time for a community board to, you know, according to the city charter, do our work. So 45 days, I think, is the is the the sweet spot because it's the minimum of the number of days for us to reliably go through a full business cycle, but also it's not taking up more time than necessary, which is 60 days is kind of like 15 days too many for, for this purpose. And hopefully they tell us, they told us on, you know, uh, May 28th that, or, you know, let's choose a different month. Let's just say, you know, four days before the next, uh, the new month that they want to do something, I get it on the calendar. We could get it done in 30 days, essentially. But they almost never do that in, in my experience. Um, just as a cyclist. I'm not saying this community board, but over the years I've read about community boards that, you know, uh, delay or run out the clock on DOT proposals for bike lanes. And so that was just something that I was curious if this. Yeah, I, I think, I think that this, you know, by its, you know, I would, I, I, I'm sure that Bob Holden is not going to be watching this, but, you know, uh, council member Holden is from a district that is, you know, Tends to be seen as, you know, the the opposing anything the city tries to do, um, and if you kind of look at the history of how he was elected, you can kind of read into that a little bit more. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe by its nature, the bill is possible the bill is conceived for that reason, but I think that it doesn't mean that DOT can't use it to become a better agency. And, um, you know, doing more engaging earlier and more often with the boards, I think that uh, we've seen um, them do more to that effect uh, and, and, and really kind of win, you know, the, the Brooklyn Bridge lane, I think, is a result of a lot of good engagement with CB1 and CB1 even asking for a lane to be taken on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but that's, I think that's kind of the high standard that we're, you know, hoping that this will, will have them emulate across the city um, under, you know, best, best conditions. But of course, you know, it can be used as, could be viewed as a way to, to be oppositional when they had to tell them about everything. But, you know, it's, it's really important to know how, how the bill is used. I think an agency can do more with it when, when pressed to do better. Hey, you want to go ahead? Just did you want to have did a talk and then we can yeah. vote? Jetta, you're still on mute. Sorry, let me get to a quieter place. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not in favor of this legislation. I think there is such a danger that it can be used as opposition. But I appreci really appreciate the work Jess did to make suggestions to make the, the, the legislation more productive. Uh, also, I just, I always, I'm not a fan of putting more reporting and notification and all of that kind of stuff onto city agencies because unless they get an added budget line to hire for it, it just means that somebody's existing job grows bigger, and that's always tough. Thanks, Betty. Yeah, I mean, this was this was just a suggestion. I mean, if people, I mean, if the committee wants to oppose this legislation outright, we can we can do that. So I, I want to hear from everyone and uh, hear what you think, because this is just a, just a suggestion. Because I echo a lot of the concerns that Cody data that all of you have had, so. Um, yeah, any suggestions? No, I, I suggest actually move to voting with the proviso that, as uh, Eric, you brought up, there is going to be the addition of the timing that the proposals come forward that we recommend they be pre agreement. So there's flexibility in actually the community board having some say that can be listened to. So just so I understand right now, um, they only have to notify community boards of certain work. This would expand the kind of street projects that they have to notify community boards of. Yes, to smaller projects. And right now, community boards have a 30 day response period and now it would be the legislation proposes 60 days, but Jesse is, is suggesting 45 days. No, it's seven. Right. Right, right now it's seven. Oh. It's thir it's, yeah, it's, they provide notification, then they have 30 days to give a presentation. And once they give the presentation, it's seven days. And this would change it to 30 days to give a presentation. And after that, there's 60 days. So where. Oh my gosh, I can really spell yeah. it out. Yeah. Yes, so. and calling for presentations when the community board might not even want them on some small projects. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I generally would rather this legislation just not go forward. But. Well, then you can vote against it, but you know, we, we have to work with what's out there. Right, no, I mean, and we also have to think about how, how we can both best be influential. 
Well, me, me, me and Patrick, what do, you, what do you guys think about it? So I, I you know, I'm, I'm listening to the comments and I think they're well taken. Um, I, I, this seemed like a good idea to me, particularly because over the years in these kinds of projects, we're always, you know, clamoring for more community notification on, and, you know, comments are always made, well, I guess they're just going to do whatever they want anyway, and we don't have much of a say in it. So I, th this tries to solve that problem, but I do see the other side of the coin and sort of the unintended consequence. Um, I, I would vote in favor of this resolution, although I, I hear our colleagues' points and, and, you know, if we want to amend the language of it a little bit to make sure we're addressing those concerns and mentioning those concerns, I'm in favor of that as well. Yes, and I think this will, especially if we add the comment that Eric recommends, and therefore be it resolved as well as in the whereas is to explain it a little bit more fully about the timing of when the notification occurs relative to the signing of contracts. Yeah, and and even if they're in the on, as Lucian was pointing it out in their on call contract sort of mode, still you know that that doesn't mean they can award a purchase order for that project and and the sort of the horses out of the barn already. To Eric's point, that, that they should notify us before that happens. Maybe that's maybe that's another way to sort of put it. If they're whether they enter into a contract or they enter into a purchase order for an existing on call contract, which is what I think they call that um, when they already have a contractor that's out there. Okay. Anything else, anyone? Yeah. Um, isn't, this, isn't this moot? Oh, sorry, listen. Isn't this whole thing moot since there's a a master plan, a law requiring a master plan? I mean, if they if they provide us with a five year look ahead of what they intend to do, then there shouldn't be any surprises um, until they come out with a master plan update. Is this, I mean, this is this law only exists if the master plan isn't funded, and they're they're good, you know, they they're forced to to continue piecemeal with uh, transportation improvements. Would well, a, I, go, go ahead, ahead Justin. Justin. <laughs> you go ahead. Sorry. Would would a would a master plan necessarily have that level of detail and be so um, inflexible that they couldn't add projects, particularly, let's say, the community's calling for a, a you know three block block three block bike lane somewhere. Uh, it wasn't part of the master plan, but I, I can foresee projects that can be sort of overlaid on top of the of the master plan. Same question, yeah. Okay. So, so can I, and specifically, I know people have asked for why isn't there a bike lane in front of the maritime building? Because it kind of left a float for a block with nothing there and it's dangerous. This actually reminds me, um, I, 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 I'm trying to plan a walkthrough with the transportation alternatives and bike New York. Um, they are asking for a, a, a better facilities, more facilities uh, going eastbound across the district um, to near Warren Street. Um, so we're going to take since that's kind of messed up right now. So um, I'm going to be sending an email out for committee members to uh, go out with me uh, on this. To, to look at the uh, state of the uh, the bike lane. Perfect. Uh, and yeah. Lucian, when it, oh, okay. do you know when the, the Lafayette Center Street ones, the extensions beyond north of Worth Street are going to go in? I don't. Sorry to sidetrack the conversation, but yeah, Patrick, I see your point um, about projects that seem to be small, but according to this legislation would qualify for for notice. Yeah, Jess, do you want to move towards a vote? Because we're approaching 8.30. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. I move for a vote. Second that. All right, here we go. Um, all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, all those opposed? All those abstaining? Any recusals? Okay, hearing none, um, 
this motion carries unanimously. Okay, great. And Jess, I'll work with you and Lucian to add the whereas as well as fix up the 2B. Okay. It's resolved okay. to reflect what Eric had mentioned. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, now this one coming back again. Hopefully, all of you just remember this one. This is a reintroduction of a bill that we did not that long ago, which was the citizen reporting of hazardous obstructions. And if you go to the next one, this is just a reminder, especially since Cody is new, but everyone else I'm sure remembers this discussion. Uh, and it was right now, Christopher Marte, our council member, uh, is one of the co-sponsors, and it really is in response to a CB1 resolution asking him to reintroduce this legislation, which sort of died simply because the end of the session came and it was never voted on. But it creates a new violation and a civil penalty for Hatton, so not criminal, civil, uh, for hazardous obstruction of a vehicle of a bicycle lane, a bus lane, when bus lane restrictions are in, are in effect, the sidewalk, crosswalks, or fire hydrants. So it's very specific. And it also has to be within the radial distance of 1,320 feet of the school building. Now, keep in mind, last time we showed a map, and our district is covered by this, except for a little corner in northwest Tribeca. So this does cover most all of our district, but not all of it. It imposes a $175 fine for each violation. The violations, there is a legal system for it. It goes to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, or OATH, so that people can oppose that either it was an error for some reason or they weren't the one that was... Whatever their oppositions are, there is a legal mechanism for them to deal with it if they should receive a fine. Uh, the DOT has to set up a civilian reporting program the regulations for what are the civilians going to report that makes it adequate for them to even send on the, the uh, file to oath. So that's in this law as well, as it was with any other law. And 25% of any proceeds collected, not billed, but not fined, but co actually collected by oath would then go to the person or persons who filed the complaint with the DOT successfully. And just so you can see the suggested resolution, therefore be it resolved. Uh, again, thanking Christopher Marte because he was responding to a, a resolution that we passed. And asking Mayor Adams to sign it there's no point of it going to law without it being signed. And Lucian, if you'd like to speak, and then Detta, Cody, and Mimi. Sorry, my hand is left up in error. Okay, then Detta, you get to kick it off. Up, oh, your hand's down. Uh, Mimi and Eric. Yeah, um, so would this include ice cream trucks in a bike lane? <sighs> it's vehicles. That's so, a vehicle. So, like any vehicle, like including an ice cream truck and a bike lane. Anybody who's not letting bikers use the bike lane. Sweet. Okay. I can be swayed. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if they're at the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, no, they're trying to fight for the, the uh, purported use being available for the purported users. So, Eric that. and then Detta. Mute, Eric. Thank you. I, I, I don't support this. The, the failure of the NYPD to enforce existing regulations sh should not lead to citizens being snitches, and especially if there's a financial incentive. Um, I, I have a question. Can the DOT issue the, these uh, summonses as well, or is it purely within the NYPD? The law does not cover the DOT doing anything but setting up this reporting mechanism. If since the oh, NYPD oh, is just... not doing it either through the Department of Traffic, then then maybe 
we need another city agency with concurrent jurisdiction on this to ensure that it gets enforced by the proper authorities and, and not relying upon citizens to report on well, speed other. cameras and things. There are lots of systems for traffic and streets in New York City that have nothing to do with the NYPD. So this is not novel in that sense. And it's not novel even in having citizen reporting because there are other laws that exist. There's some around taxis and there's certainly about the idling of, of buses. Yeah, but I, that's why I don't support this. This is too easy yeah. for, for spiteful people, you know, spiteful and petty people to 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 do this under the guise of doing it for the public. It's it's it, it'll create it could lead to some violence. And I, I don't really want to live in a society where everyone keeps on, rat, you know, snitching on people. And especially if there's a monetary incentive. No, and you can certainly take that position, but this is not a novel or new thing. And there has not been any violence attached to the others, so. But then it doesn't mean that we need to keep on extending it for every petty thing. Well, if I use a bike lane safely, it wouldn't be considered petty by you, but. No, I do use bike lanes, but it doesn't mean that every citizen should be able to, to report on other people if it's something incidental, like let's say dropping off somebody incidentally and there are there are proper authorities to enforce the law. It should not be the citizens to to report and other citizens for financial gain. Yeah, no, thank you. And I understand then that with certainly people take that position. Uh Dede, Dede and then Cody. Okay, yeah, it's really nice to hear that Councilman Marte is is did you say he's sponsoring this? Or he's one of the sponsors yep okay so that's really great it's too bad that his rep max left the call to hear our discussion on this but i've been supportive of this every time it's come before community board i mean i see the illegally parked cars that are creating dangerous situations and it is i feel so powerless so it would be nice to, to be able to give people an empowerment to deal with the legal behavior that they see. So, um, and I'm really pleased that the council member for our district is supporting. All right, Lucian, did you have something to clarify? And then we'll move on to Cody. Yeah, I just wanna put this in context. Um, as a community board district manager, <laughs> my job is defining the charter to be responsible for quality of life and service delivery for this district. Um, in that role, I receive on a daily basis, you know, many, many, many uh, uh, complaints and, and uh, uh, tips as to uh, uh, requests for enforcement um, from not just the general public, but from almost every board member. Um, it is a universal uh, desire when people see something to, and they've been they've been asked to say something. You know, since 9/11, it's been a mantra for for almost every agency. And so, um, you know, I, I just do want to make it clear that people are asking for enforcement with summonsable summonsable charges uh, and fines for almost every enforcement agency. Um, this the difference here in my view, is that um, it cuts out the, the middleman, so to speak, and allows for the, 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 the enforcement to happen directly. It is not an easy thing to, uh, uh, to do. Um, so with the, um, the existing process for DEP, if someone observes a idling vehicle, uh, they must not just you know, take a picture, but they have to have a sustained video um, for one minute longer than the statute dictates. So three minutes, unless it's in front of the school, then it's like two minutes, something to that effect. They have to capture certain elements of the vehicle, the license plate, uh, uh, make it clear that it's it's doing what it's you know what they report it to be doing, and then they have to package the video, fill out forms. Um, there's a lot to it, and um, and it's a lot to ask for someone to do. And um, if you know, I, you know, I'm paid by the city to to, to do this. Um, 
uh, New Yorkers generally are not uh, expecting compensation, but uh, I do think that my what I've observed with the the idling law is that um, it's uh, they've gone from almost no enforcement to uh, an incredible amount of uh, of, of enforcement, and if that's any kind of endorsement of the model, uh, I do think it's an effective model, and it's it's not really anything, in my view, anything different from what people are kind of asking me to do, kind of as a you know a chain reaction rather than doing so directly. Yeah, thank you. And Cody, if you'd like to, I would I would just agree with what Lucian just said, and also say I really support this. Um, I think that, that it's unfortunate, but the, you know, as far as any enforcement from NYPD or any other, you know, law enforcement agency, it's not going to happen. And we know that by the num record number of automobile um, related deaths in New York City the past year. Um, so, and I can't tell you how many times though I've utilized social media to shame trucks or cars parked in bike lanes. And I think that, you know, to be able to, um, to, you know, have summons with a civil, civil, uh, um, violation is, 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 a, is a step in the right direction. Yeah, thank you. And, and obviously, uh, council member Marte felt the same way. <laughs> Cause our district is very heavily affected by this. Well, let me call a vote on this because you can vote up or down, but. Lucian, if you want to take it over. Lucian? Sorry, I just want to share one thing. Sure. Um, this is, it's, it's not a great graph, but this is um, from the Beta NYC's board stat tool. And this is just kind of showing um, placard uh, enforcement complaint on 311. And of course, it's not displaying the data in a, a really eye friendly way, but this is in the thousands and this is per month. Um, so you'll see all the different years from 2010 to 2022 um, from left to right uh, per month. And you can see that um, uh, this is this is something that's only been increasing. If you kind of look to the left, and move to the right in any month. Um, this is a problem that hasn't been getting better. Um, if you're looking at 311 data as a as an indicator. So with that, I'll um, pardon me because I know the motion was made to vote. So let me do that. Um, all those let me stop sharing my screen so you can see my vote sheet. All those who are opposed. Eric, you votes no. Okay. Eric, you. You opposed any other op votes in opposition? All those abstaining? All those recusing? All right, with that, the motion carries. All right, well, let's see what comes next because I know it's getting late. And ah, street co naming guidelines. Let me put a limit on this one, but. I think it might be fairly quick and you see maybe surprised because I would like some feedback if possible so that I can propose something for next month. Uh, this all I did was look at organizations and criteria for historic events places. So I'm staying away from individuals so I can get a sense from people for kind of where you want to go. Remember the reason for starting this review of our guidelines. Uh, was that we have historic street grid, a limited number of streets, and the co-naming law has uh, no expiration date, which means once you get it, you get it forever. There's no need for renewal. So you do have to look at it with what would people going to look at 75, 100 years from now, this co-naming, and they may very well not be able to apply for anything because all the streets could be taken by then anyway. So in our district with a sad history of mass terrorist events, I know it was brought up by Alice and others, the issues that, for instance, after 9-11, there can be a big rush for, oh, let's name something for each of the people that were injured. 
Uh, so these are just realities that are part of the whole picture here of codenaming in our district. But given that, you go to the next one, because this is pretty specific. As we look at the, these are the present ones for organizations. They have to be a nonprofit to a minimum of 30 years of community involvement. Three, have a demonstrated extraordinary and consistent voluntary commitment and dedication to the community. So again, it's pretty wide open. Nothing is terribly well defined other than the 30 years. For the recommended ones, the proposed ones, and then you can talk about, you can compare the two and, and make any comments. The perspective, perspective honoree has to be a nonprofit organization because that's already, so that was taken from the old guidelines. That has provided a minimum of 30 years of very significant community benefit. So it's kind of connected the things with the time frame. Has demonstrated an extraordinary, consistent, and continuous voluntary commitment. Voluntary is for you to think about and talk about. Uh, commitment and dedication to the community of Community District 1. Have an address in Manhattan Community District 1. Another thing to talk about. And four, is currently in existence in the street and block that are proposed for co-naming, or if they're not, they're no longer in existence or they've moved, the organization must have a historical, a significant historical note and be clearly associated with the selected street proposed for co-naming. So again, this tries to make more of a link between what's being asked and have the applicant tell us why this street, why this particular organization. And why don't we talk about that, and we may or may not get to historic events. But in fact, that was changed fairly recently, and I'm not proposing any significant changes there anyway. So I will hear more from this. And Lucian, if you'd like to start it off, I see your hand. Lucian, you there? Um, my hand is down. Sorry. Okay. Would anyone have any comments, or do you want to just think about it and talk about it next month? I'll go where the committee wants. Think about it and talk about it next month. Yeah, same here. Okay. Then that sounds like enough agreement. We will do that, and I will send some of this to you by email, so you can look at it. But as I said, for the other one, the historic places and events, I'm not suggesting any changes, but I'll send that so you can take a look at it in advance of next month's meeting. So thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry, there are some uh, things at the end because there are a couple of announcements in there, the updates in the news. There are two city bike station locations. The first one, they're moving from the north parking lot of South Street, east of Broad Street, uh, the old location was Water Street and Whitehall. If you go to the next one, which is a map, I think it shows it. Yeah, where they're moving them. So it's it's coming down not terribly far. It's going about a block away. But for those who are looking, I believe these changes have already been made anyway. The next relocation is from the BN, the Bank of New York Mellon and the DC 37 building at the southeast corner of Murray Street and West Street. And it's moving to the east side of the driveway of the parking lane on the south side of Murray Street. And if you go to the next picture, you can see it, next slide, you can see it. So it's going to move from where you can see it kind of over here in the corner under the tree. You can see where it's going to move over by where this lady's standing. It's going to be in the curb space the parking lane over kind of by where she is. It's going to be the new location. And part of the reason, well, the reason for that is if you recall, there's going to be a refurbishing of this whole space and it's going to become the uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, Plaza. Plaza, yeah. And the community board was very concerned that the community, that the city bike dock not be moved too far because many people use it when they go to the uh, ball fields in Battery Park City or other places such as the Whole Foods and others. So they wanted it kept in the same area. That came from the community board. 
Next one, just to let people know, because this was kind of interesting to see, they posted this on Twitter, but they are making, they being uh, Lyft, who's, who handles the city bikes, they are making some changes in the configuration so that they can shorten uh, the stations or docks, the way they're laid out. So you can look forward to starting to see these. I have not seen any in person yet. By staggering this a little bit, they can reduce the length of it. I hope some of you find that as good news. Uh, also, New York State Legislature, in their big rush to finish up, did extend the use of red lights and school zone speed cameras in New York City. Uh, they failed to increase the number of cameras as asked by the mayor and the street safety groups requested. Uh, they also did not give local control, they did give local control for the existing locations, but now they can be 24 hours, seven days a week, and the extension is for three years, not the length of time that the mayor asked for, which was longer. So at least they're not expiring, which they were due to, to, have, to happen. And I think that might be it. Is if you go to the next slide, if there is one. That's it. Great, then that is the news blurbs. So if there's nothing else, I will let you enjoy the rest of your evening. How long, wait, so the, the traffic cameras used to be on only essentially like during business hours, right? Who knows? They, went to, they, they used well, to be 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. Right, and off on weekends, and they found that 60% of the accidents and things occurred during the off hours, and I think that's what pushed the legislature to extend the hours. Is that immediate? Is that now now? I'd have to look at the law to see when it started, but I believe it is pretty effective. So Has the governor so signed it yet? That's the part I'm, I'm not sure of, because there's so and much what, legislation to be signed. Yeah, and, and um, even though the speed cameras aren't ticketing in the off hours, they were still, you know, gathering data, so they were able to kind of create a like a, a, a 24 hour matrix of when you know these sorts of speeding events are happening and you know much of it is happening when they're off yeah. <laughs> that's really good news yeah so that that is going to change and we'll just have to watch out for the mail i will keep an eye out for the governor to doing signatures because there are lots of bills that i know of interest when it is in effect it will be up on the dof website because uh, they handle the tickets. Oh, thanks, Jetta. Any other comments? Otherwise, good night, all. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, one thing. One thing. Um, yes. Everyone, look. The uh, uh, the MTA has posted uh, draft schedules for the Long Island Railroad uh, in anticipation of the completion of uh, 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 East Side Access. Um, which is what well, they'll be referring to as Grand Central Madison, I think. Correct. It, that's right, Eric. Yes, so, correct. So um, there will be some some goodies for uh, New Yorkers who uh, wish to uh, uh, not not just leave out of Grand Central, but um, there's some other improvements um, with service uh, from Atlantic to Jamaica uh, and some other and some other uh, points um, outside of Manhattan. So. Uh, please take a look um, that may help you make some movements west that uh, maybe you weren't uh, planning on using the train for. Have a look. Okay, everyone, that's all I got. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Stopping the recording now.